that's a challenge we all have. You know, me and Ian from a journalistic point of view, yours from a professional point of view, Rich over there from a comms point of view. You mean you don't want to be shaved on the top of Mount Snowden like Kevin no. Bacon? Anyone comes near me with a robot arm with a razor on it, <laughs> there's going to be violence. Um, no, that's, that's your new book. I can't think of, I can't think of, yes. <laughs> I know, hopefully that will sell a bit better. Um, Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. I'm delighted to say we've got a very special guest this week, Neil McRae from BT, who I think you're officially our most grown-up guest we've got, and I should explain what that means, because <laughs> I'm sure you can be just as childish as anyone else when you put your mind to it, but I, I use the term grown-up to describe people sort of further up the corporate food chain um, than I am, which is nearly everyone. <laughs> um, and I think you are your chief architect. That's BT. Right. I mean, that definitely sounds like the most grown-up job title. I know we've had CEOs, but of smaller companies, all due respect to people like Danielle, who are CEOs. But BT is a fairly big company, isn't it? So, thank you for coming thank you, in. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you for legitimising this, <laughs> this drunken shit show of a podcast. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that'll take you very far with my legitimacy, but uh, good luck. <laughs> no, that's it. I was, um, I was just saying yesterday, a bit more name-dropping. Yesterday I was in town because I went to the DCMS, the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, I think that is. Department of Fun. Department of Fun. Well, actually, there's, a, there's an anecdote around that as well. To interview someone called Julia Lopez, who is basically the overall head in the government of specifically infrastructure. So she reports into Nadine Doris, which is slightly awkward because I've been fairly unpleasant about her on the pod. And I got a feeling they'd all seen her. I was like, oh, yeah. Nadine, not yeah. Julie, Julie Lopez. No, I don't Nadine. think I've ever mentioned Julia. Um, and I actually walked past Nadine's office. I was wondering if she's going to be in there asking, all right, Nadine, how's it going? But um, I don't think she was. Um, and I was doing that. It's partly um, the initial premise of me interviewing her was for an informer event called Open Round World. And um, Julia couldn't make it out to this thing in Berlin, but she wanted to do a recorded thing. And, and the producer asked me to chat to her. I thought, well, this is cool. You don't get to chat to her. Um, you know, she's not quite a cabinet minister, but she's next rung down, I think. Certainly some kind of minister. Um, every day. And, and I got to go into 100 Parliament Street, which is where went from the balcony from which Winston Churchill did his VE Day speech and on uh, the back of it there's the war rooms and all that. So, so yeah, that was <coughs> that's all cool. That's why you look so smart in that photo. Now, now, I, now yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, that's there's right. There's a picture of you on LinkedIn. You didn't go in your Slayer on. t-shirt there. <laughs> no. Chicken. No, I actually made an effort, which I haven't for you. I don't know what that says about the esteem in which I hold you versus Julia Lopez. <laughs> Um, but no, I actually wore like a, a tweed jacket and a shirt. Oh wow, it's like a wedding. I call, I call it my World War <laughs> Congress costume because I, I, I have to dress up not not to be a journalist, but when I'm doing commercial videos, I can't be in a slayer yeah, t-shirt yeah, either. Yeah. I think, well, I haven't well, tried. You have to blank to it out. Fun. You'll have to have that fuzz over right. it that they do on on <laughs> commercial TV. Yeah, yeah. Other other thrash bands are They're available. Um, <laughs> when you're a fuck coronavirus one. <laughs> yes, I know. Have you ever seen that one? Uh, oh, I may have done. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a metallic one and it's, it's got instead of the U it's just got a coronavirus shaped splat it's oh very clearly saying fuck coronavirus um, oh yes. which is good that's my memento from the great plague um, but yeah that, that was really fun it was good chatting to her she's she's totally sort of polished and prepared as you'd expect mesmerising eyes because we're doing like camera on both of us so I had to sort of look at her properly the whole time couldn't really look away and she's got big green eyes and I was just like getting lost in them if I'm honest <laughs> you've fallen so, in love I know. <laughs> I'll tell your wife about this. Does she watch this podcast? I know. <laughs> I know. Or, if, or if Julia watches this, <laughs> she can think, you dirty stalker. Um, but no, I just mean it as a compliment, and I might move on before I dig myself into some kind of uh, hole there. Um, but yeah, that was all groovy. And then, oh yeah, one other thing to mention. And then later on, um, yesterday evening, went out to dinner with our new team member, our meter. And she's very excited to join. And it's great to get to know her properly, because I'd only spoken to her in the interview setting. She had a good laugh, did a bottle of uh, Bordeaux. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it felt like quite a productive day. Getting out. Oh, and I did a live um, <coughs> webinar from this very studio. So, anyway, enough about me. Um, what we'll do, that we'll, I'll get into the what we're going to chat about a bit, and then we'll introduce ourselves properly to Neil and go on from there. So, obviously, we're going to chat about BT in some form. We haven't really given it much thought, have we? We're going to kind of wing it. And I go, BT then, what's that all about? <laughs> what's that all about? Um, 
Uh, well, you're British and you do telecoms, <laughs> don't you, at the end of the day? So we'll start by doing that. And then, as we threatened to do in previous pods, we're going to get into the pros and cons of 5G a little bit more. Uh, Neil, I don't know why. Is there someone called Gavin McRae? No. I keep nearly saying Gavin. Colin. Colin McRae. Colin McRae. Uh, yeah, I don't know why. I keep, I keep nearly saying Gavin. It's really bizarre. Um, anyway, Neil... Uh, has obviously forgotten more about 5G, especially the techie side of it, and I'll ever know. So uh, we get a chance to be put straight on some of our shooting from the hip suppositions about 5G that we've um, articulated on this pod over the last few weeks. And I think we're going to finish off in the more newsy one. Uh, this week, it's mainly been about what, streaming companies and how they're doing. Netflix took a big dive. Um, CNN... Uh, Created a streaming service which folded within like three weeks. I'd, yeah, I just I'd, such I'd a saw great that story, effort. but I don't know the details of why it went so badly. So I'm you all over it. On that. I'm all over it. And then it was um, so expensive for what it was. Yeah, no, it's it's just a car it's like crash. Seven dollars or something. It's even worse than things like Quibi. Oh. I don't know if you remember Quibi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah we talked about like that. F- what one minute video version of that's Netflix. it it was meant to be it was meant to be like mobile specific yeah. so you oh, just got yeah. little short yeah, videos just for viewing on your phone but, but that's not what CNN was doing though mm. this is proper sort of streaming yeah, like, yeah well CNN was CNN was even more ill conceived anyway I'll, well basically they said because <laughs> their their ratings are going down the toilet ever since Trump got voted out so they people like them and M- MSNBC in the US used to get a lot of their ratings from just the latest outrage at Trump's tweet or some some oafish thing that he said, and then now he's gone, and they're supposed, you know, and they're all quite polarised in the states. So they're, they're inclined to be supportive of Biden because the, the media there tends to be Democrat, and Biden's sitting there just sort of dribbling and not knowing what side of the stage to leave on. But yeah, they can't really lay into him, and even if they did, it's not the same, is it? It'd be sad. It, it's just sad. It's like, oh, bless him. Someone get him a cup of warm tea and a rug. Yeah. Um, so, so their so their ratings have gone down the toilet, and so they thought, okay, no one's watching this shit for free. I know what we'll do. We'll charge them. <laughs> Honestly, that seems to be the long and short of the strategy there. So we'll we'll talk about that to sign off. And just to remind you that if you're watching this on the site or on YouTube or on Facebook, you can also listen to it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, loads of other podcasting platforms. And if you like the stuff I come out with, then please subscribe to telecoms.com. And if you like the stuff that Ian comes out with, please subscribe to Light Reading. If you like stuff Neil comes out with, then get a BT broadband contract. Maybe. Hell yes. <laughs> which, I, which I do have, by the way. Which you do have. And I've got an EE one. Should we, should we just moan about give him, that? Give him two beers. Yeah. <laughs> should we, uh, you probably can't see any of the cameras, but we've got, a, we've got an absolutely abundance of riches on the beers. So Neil bought a bunch of Coronas. Um, we got, we've got a friend of the show. Uh, there we go. And, uh, and we've stashed a bunch of them. We've got a friend of the Possibly. show, Richard Fogg, in the background. Say hello, Richard. Hello, Richard. <laughs> and, uh, and he brought this, this sort of big uh, cooler full of um, various brew dog, no, not brew dog, uh, Beaver Town stuff, for which we're very grateful. Um, so, yes, that's all good. So, yeah, um, Neil, right, so you're, why don't we just take it from the top? You're chief architect yeah. for BT. What does that mean? Do you build, make buildings, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, kind of. Um, so my job is to is to kind of if you imagine BT as a jigsaw puzzle, I'm the instructions to the jigsaw puzzle. So how do all the pieces fit together, um, and that covers all manner of things across everything that BT does globally, um, in broadband, in mobile, in TV, and um, and and um, parts of open reach. But there's a there's a uh, an air gap with how open reach works but at a group level we obviously have to ensure that what we're doing is going to work and it's going to mm. satisfy our strategy um, and really <clears throat> I have, you know if, if someone comes out and says we want to do widget A we need to make sure widget A works with all the other widgets and, and it's and ultimately um, and this is an, a kind of an old fashioned term that we're making loads of money out of it. I mean, that's 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 the that's the goal. We mustn't lose sight of that. No, and 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 quite often we do. And and then because and and the reason it's important is is that you know every few years we have to invest in more infrastructure when the next you know either in capacity or in new features from functionality. So you know being able to reinvest in the network is is crucially important. And I've worked for 
other telcos who didn't get that right, and they don't tend to last for very long. Um, if, if, so if, if you don't get the balance right, and then you get to a point where the underinvestment starts to catch up with you. Yeah, and 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 you've got nothing to sell. Uh, yeah. Um, especially in the in the kind of business markets in, in particular. So, um, you know, I've, I'm very much on the mind of what our customers need right now. What's the best way of giving that to them, and then how do we evolve that to the next thing that they might want, and try and you know try and do two things you know understand what they might need and also do a bit of demand generation which is hey if you don't have this you're going to need this um and and you know to to try and keep momentum with with what our customers need um and and actually what makes the what ultimately what makes the kind of the whole country function at some point mm. in time there's because we do you know lots of people just see us as the broadband and mobile organization but we run a lot of big um infrastructures for um, the government for other utilities that that keep lots of other things going, which which is you know, which is very important was very important to the pandemic. Um, and so when you say other role, utilities, is this is this just communications infrastructure or other stuff? I mean, no, so we so we we run networks that support um, customers that are in the oil and gas space, right? That are in um, generation of electricity, so pretty mission um, critical stuff. Hospitals, police. Um, you know, we we do a huge amount of um, you know what we call blue light um, services as well to keep um, those organisations running. Um, and we try and help them become better at what they do, and and that you know that's where a lot of what we're trying to do in five G is around how do we make what those organisations have got to do better. And and it, and I mean I work at BT um, <clears throat> because of the mission. The mission at BT is we call it Connect for Good, which you know from a corporate mission point of view, everyone says, well, of course you do. But um, I personally believe in in what we do. Come in and, and if I, I reflect on my own background. Um, you know, I learned all about networking literally by going in the library and reading. Um, the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way, and and, and I, you know, and 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 learning about programming, about computers, and and, I, and my own personal belief is, the more people we get connected, the more people have access to the network, the better it is for them personally, and the better it is for society as a whole. And mm. and in BT, that that we're lucky in that that is really the core heart of the mission, and of course. You know, we have to make some money for our investors, and we have to reinvest to 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 to, um, to keep the train going. As it indeed, were. Uh, that you sort of touch on a thing that that was occurring to me while I was chatting to Julia Lopez. Did I mention that? You yeah. did. Uh, something about eyes and <laughs> yeah, getting lost. I was staring into her eyes yesterday. <laughs> um, the uh, because the the context of it was talking um, specifically about the, the government um, get involved in uh, open round, and we might chat about that in a bit. Um, and you know, I'm I'm instinctively a sort of small government, sort of laissez-faire libertarian type of person. I don't know but, how many times you've said that in this podcast. Yeah, I know. Do I labour that make, point? I should make a, comp- a compilation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do a compilation. Oh, we should have a box every time you say it. We have One to day, oh, no, I'm going to screw you up and just say I'm a dirty authoritarian commie. <laughs> um, but there's always a reason for me saying it because it's framing something. I know, I know. Thank you very much. Um, Anyway, with that caveat in mind, uh, yeah, I, I'm not comfortable with with government getting involved in stuff that should that is basically commercial. But I do have to accept that within telecoms, there's there's special rules. Firstly, that there's I do believe that telecoms does need fairly thorough regulation because the barriers to entry are so high that if you didn't have it there, that the potential for cartel like behaviour uh, is is there. Um, and then there's what what you were alluding to, which is this sort of strategic mission critical side of things, where you know as much as BT is, is a commercial operation, it, it's what it does has has colossal impact on everyone's everyday life. Absolutely. It's a little bit like, um, although even more substantially, like back in two thousand seven eight, taxpayers ended up bailing out banks because they were so central to the the proper functioning of the economy that we couldn't afford to let them go down. Tel- telcos, especially big telcos, are kind of like that as well. So, yeah, I d- that's not really leading up to a question. It's more of just sort of monologue. But, I mean, it is interesting, I guess, just sort of encouraging you to expand on, yeah, on mean, that I mean, relationship. Look, ev- every single 999 call answered through the pandemic was answered by someone that works for BT. Um, and, and, you know, through the pandemic, that was a, a crucially important thing. 
we had to organise the teams so that they could work safely, and 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 they were the, the teams themselves were comfortable. They, in my mind, they did an absolutely outstanding job. All of our field people working out there, keeping the network running whilst we're all working from home and watching Netflix. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's that aspect of it that really gets me out of bed in the morning. And and yeah, there's some great technology that comes along, and, and you know, I I've got a reputation for being a bit of a skeptic on on you know, super duper new technology because I frame it in that way. I'm like, okay, how does this help me make our country, the the people, be more successful? Yeah. And if Rather it's not technology ob- for its own sake. Yeah. If it's not obvious to me, I'm like, mm, really? Um, and and it's you know that's it's not. I'm trying to be difficult or or obtuse or just I know better. It's it's like I need to be convinced. And and you know, I've there's. There's certain parts of what we do in the network that I understand really well that we absolutely have to get nails. One example, the whole optical layer. You get that wrong, everything else you build is wrong. I mean, it's like I use um, the analogy of if if you're in the wrong gear on a push bike and you're going uphill, it's really hard. Hmm. And the optical bit of the network is the gearing of the network. You get that right, you get it really, really right, and, and it's a downhill slide. You get it wrong, and everything that you're doing is is really hard. So I'm always looking at it through that sort of lens, and, and I'm coming at it from, okay, we've got this piece, we've got this piece, we've got this piece, and then customers are here, and they're here, and they're there. How are we making sure that all of the things that they're trying to do, they can do it, they can, and and, all, and also that they love it. They, I don't want to just get out and say, oh, it's great. I want customers to love what we're doing, and, and and it's important that the service we provide to them is fantastic. We don't always get that right, you know. And and I'll sit down at a dinner table with friends, and I'll say I'm from BT, and I promise you, I'll get a story <laughs> of doom yeah. every time. And, but what I do is <coughs> I take the details and I follow up on it and try and make it better. Um, usually we learn something. And so you know, how many people have got sacked as a result of these dinner parties you've had? <laughs> <laughs> None, because because I think I mean this is the other thing is no one uh, no one in, in our company comes in to do a bad job. The, the, mm. our, we got a super motivated team. Uh, I, f- I feel privileged to kind of be part of it because. Um, if, if that team doesn't work together, it doesn't take a lot for the whole thing to kind of jam up the, the the pipework, if you like. So you know, the the we are all about trying to empower people to make the right decisions where they are in the field. And and you know, it's you think about you know when you see BT, most people think in, in our industry they think of the headquarters with a logo at the top of the building or the tower. That you Don't know, get me that's, that's, on the logo, the, mate. That, that's an important <laughs> part of. The, of um, BT, but what BT is about is, you know, the, the the men and women in vans out in front of our customers connecting stuff, people up towers, putting stuff onto the yeah. towers, our guys in shops selling phones to people. That is what the company's about, um, and that is where you know we we really try to make a difference. And and you know I think I, I, there's never a week where I can't look in the mirror and be really proud of something we've done. There's some stuff that I wish we could do better, and, and we we try, but. Um, it's I, I, I genuinely this might find a, a kind of sound a bit ass kissing, but I genuinely love working in a place like that. Yeah, are, are you, are you finding your your jobs getting harder because you, you're obviously coming in from a technical angle, but with you know it's interesting you're saying you have to think about the, the investment returns and whether it pays off. And this isn't specific to BT, but you know we we hear all service providers saying how how much traffic demands are growing and, and the revenues aren't obviously going up at the same pace. Um, you know, we've got this big fibre rollout going on, not just in the UK, but lots of markets. We've got a very expensive 5G rollout that's still being done. Is it making things more difficult for you on a sort of day-to-day basis with, with, with all of that? I think from a day-to-day perspective, I'd say no. But, but I think, you know, we look at the future um, of, you know, my job is to, I call it netification. Everyone talks about cloudification, which, which I'm like, why? Because um, it's a network that's, that's brought the cloud to life, right? And my my job at the heart of it is to make everyone more and more dependent on the network, right? So in doing that, that means I've got to solve that problem. I've got to solve the problem of here's a whole lot of traffic coming. 
um, here's the investment we need to make, and here's how we scale it. And it's not just about the money, it's about actually can we build a network that scales this big? And does it work in the way that our customers expect it to? Is the signaling right? Is the is the um, routing updates right? There's a whole load of parameters that go into it. And <clears throat> again, it doesn't take very much to go from the success layer to lots of challenges. And and you know the team that that I'm 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 lucky to work with are again focused on that mission as well. Um, but I, I kind of believe that the future of the network is less and less about capacity and more and more and more about actions and, and reactions. So, you know, how are you, how's the network getting more involved in the things that you do from a day to day life perspective, like going to see the doctor or getting on a plane or whatever the things you are doing? You know, we've taken the network to a certain point and and, and this is where <clears throat> I wanted to kind of chime in to, to something you guys talked about on, the, on, on one of the previous podcasts, which is what was 5G really about at its heart? Mm. <clears throat> and, and 5G at its heart was to tackle one big issue. It was all about scale, right? And, you know, 4G, um, the people who worked on 4G did an epic job of taking us out of the kind of TDM world and putting us into IP. Massively hard job, nailed it, right? And, and you know, just think 2011, just as we were launched, just as 4G was coming out, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about Netflix at some point. I mean, that didn't exist. And a thousand dollar things that we used to, and take for granted today did not exist. I used Uber to get here, right? All that sort of stuff. Um, and then, but it, it scales, 4G scales really well for us humans with smartphones, right? What it doesn't scale for is the myriad of devices and machines and, and things that want to be part of the network. Um, and what 5G was brought in to do the first part of it was okay how do we unlock how the network works so that um we can add a billion devices two billion devices three billion devices and it will still work most of them not with humans involved so that that's kind of 5g well, that's core. why it gets conflated with iot even though iot as a technology <clears throat> existed predates 5g yeah but uh, and 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 yeah i mean iot was very much uh, uh a simple kind of blink type service for the most part you know there's there's, there's it's hard to point to a, a big iot thing that isn't a simple type service right yeah um and also quite often iot is using gateways or or other ways of of kind of connecting some iot network to the rest of the network um but and IoT is is you know it's still hugely in its infancy in my view. There's there's, yeah, there's much more um, to come for come from IoT. But then it's okay. I've got this IoT thing which helps humans. Actually, I've got a bunch of machinery or a bunch of other stuff that I need this I, the IoT stuff that we've got and the other things that we've got to be able to interact. And you know, I, I use one of the use case examples that I, I was really excited about. Um, we called it connected ambulance. Right. And, and, you know, people think, well, you know, I, I get in my car and I can listen to Apple Music and, you know, what's special about that? Right. Um, here's what's special about Connected Ambulance. One, where is it and, and, and where, is, where is the ambulance? Where has it got to get to? What type of, of incident is it, re is it responding to? Is it an elderly patient that may, might have had a heart attack? Is it a car crash? First of all, you've got to find out where it is, and then what what are the type of patients, and then and then what's the diagnosis for those patients? And what we were trying to do with with connected ambulance was that by the time an ambulance arrived into the hospital, the team that were going to deal with the patients already knew what to do. Right. Whereas if whereas before, you know, a patient turns up, they're doing a diagnostic, yeah. they're trying to figure out what's going on, um, and and in my mind, you know, you know saving two or three minutes in that space of time could change someone's world because because they could have you know the worst situation or the best situation totally um so no it's good use because in fact that's considering like we had a guest on our last guest before this was uh, someone who i had used um a project they'd worked on years ago as a sort of exemplar of or something to take the piss out of <clears throat> 5g being overhyped which was a uh, robotic surgery, and she was. It was quite funny. I didn't know she was involved in it. I, I knew the the lead of the project, but um, when we were chatting to her before, and, and she was so, like, "Yeah, it was actually me. It did all that." And I was like, "Oh, sorry." But anyway, the point I'm making is that I think your connected ambulance one. I can sort of get my head around that 
as a more tangible, more immediate, um, plausible use case rather than rather than actually, yeah, that reminds me, I, I threatened to do this, rather than some of the stuff that you get in EE ads. <laughs> but, uh, so, so I mean, I mean, yeah, look, um, we've got two jobs, and I, I talked about generating demand, right, yeah. at the start. So we, so we, we got two jobs in our business. One is to create connectivity. The other is to signal what the art of the possible is, right? Yeah. And actually, I, we were also involved in the remote surgery. Okay. All right, um, I'll just keep landing myself so, in it. Then. So, well... Well, they're going to send, actually, it a, they're I, gonna send I, in a robot with a scalpel next to it. About 20 up. organizations were looking at this, right? right? Because, because actually, it turns out, one of the biggest challenges that we've got in medicine is a lack of surgeons, right? So why wouldn't you look at it? It's, it's bleeding obvious, right? So, But the reality is, is would I go underneath a 5G? You know I mean? Probably not, right? However, what that did was it started people thinking about okay if we did want to make this true what do we need to do we need to solve haptics we need to so you know we need to understand the latency we need to understand the reliability and if you use something that's very extreme like that then you'll probably create 50 other things that yeah. don't need that extreme that's a fair thing point. is that why you're wearing a nasa jacket <clears throat> and what that enabled to discover that's a good tangent actually because uh, <laughs> uh you know i know that uh you're wearing a NASA jacket because yep. space has long been uh, a, a core interest of yours but and we can get into that on a, on a sort of neil personal level sure. but in terms of the point you're making i know a hell of a lot of technology not just military but other technology sort of comes from some of the stuff they did in nasa back yeah, in the day. i mean i mean we wouldn't have smartphones if it wasn't for people going to the moon that's right. really clear the whole mm. that's um, where they found them was it the whole <laughs> <laughs> Um, the whole signal, the whole semiconductor industry came from that world. The whole software engineering came from. Oh, there's, a, there's a British guy; his name escapes me, but he's actually got code on um, kind of five of the lunar landers on the moon. British guy that wrote it at MIT. Right. So, and then the the um, the World Wide Web guy. That was initially just there as a way of sort of people collaborating within a sort of techie yeah. environment, and, wasn't it? And, it? and and everyone uses it every day for just mm. about everything. So I think you have to set those, you know, hairy, audacious goals, as Fair we, enough. Like, we like right. to, to, to call point. them. But there are some, you know, don't get me wrong, there are some use cases where I look at them and think... Mm. Shaving on top of a mountain. Yeah, well, well maybe, yeah, <laughs> but, again, <laughs> but again... But um, again, look, again, you've got to, you know, you, you, we, we want to... In an industry where, you know, if you try and say what is telecoms, you show fiber and cables. It's yes, like, well, well that's a good boring point. as hell, right? Yeah, yeah. So here's here's the guy that that's um, the, the devil, in, in, in a couple of TV programs, and and you know he's 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 well known. Um, we take him up somewhere and, and we show again what the art of the possible is, and and again, it, it, the the goal is is and and, and I, I believe this. The best technology comes out when people are inspired. And what we're trying to do there is inspire people, inspire the next generation to be technologists and to get into networking and, and come, you know, make a difference in the world. And that's, that again, that's one of the reasons why I work at BT. Is, is this scale thing that you mentioned, just going back, you were saying that the difference is scale and supporting, <coughs> you know, million, billions potentially of devices, which hasn't really, you, you just couldn't do that with 4G, but no. it's not on the radio side we're talking about there, is it? This is part, this, part of it. I mean, some of it's on the radio side. Side. So you know, there's a, there's a number of things that we, that we did. We improved the whole authentication platform, um, SDM as we call it. We 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 improved the signalling. So we took the signalling out of the kind of data stream of what people are doing, so that we can scale that differently to to the scale that's required for um, traffic. And and that just allows us to put you know some high availability around that. You know when when you're when you're getting your shave or your doctor's chopping your arm off, yeah. so that that works really well, right? So, um, in 4G, <clears throat> I mean that was on the radar of 4G, but it was kind of like we're running out of time. We've got to get 4G out there, and and then and on the radio side, you know the radio side was was also about optimization of spectrum. So, in the in the world of physics, spectrum runs out. There's you know you the, there's no magic that you know that comes along un unless um, Star Trek turns up and 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 changes the laws of physics. Um, 
I got it out. I got it out, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Neil threatened to drop some uh, Star Trek quotes. And they, and they reacted they reacted accordingly. So, no, I mean, but I, I could have done something more obvious. I like, could have, yeah. A, like, like don't a listen, dong. crystals. Oh, well, actually, that gets us. I was about to do a shit Scotty impression. <laughs> And of course, I've done I've done a shit Neil McRae impression. Yeah, I was, was going to do my um, my impression of Scott and impre- uh, uh, doing an impression of me. Hello, <laughs> it's Neil McRae. That <laughs> sounds just like. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I sound nothing like that, but uh, but I did appreciate the the, the gesture. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my <clears throat> accent's probably more inspired by sort of um, Mike Myers, like Fat Barson, yeah. like Gold Member, or something like that, <laughs> or, or Shrek. Um, but yes, well, that's good to hear it uh, reflected back at me, and and that you haven't taken offence. I have not taken offence. I've not taken offence. So I mean, to, to kind of finish that off, you know, we're we're trying to. In, in the radio side, um, look, <clears throat> the way we do radio, actually, the, at the core of it, hasn't changed for, for, for hundreds of years. You know, it's, it's about generating a signal. There are aspects within the radio that add optimization, make it easier to optimize, and, and, in, and in 5G, with the, the, as you go into these wider spectrum bands, that optimization becomes more and more important. Otherwise, it's harder to... to, to share a chunk of spectrum between a number of users and and that's where MIMO comes in that's where beam forming comes in because these you know it's it's easy to say oh, well we've just made the 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 pipe wider if you're if you're not if you're not optimizing that and leveraging that effectively then maybe three people are getting something that's great yeah. and everyone else is getting rubbish so that's what that's what's coming to to 5G and R. Is there is there similarities to what we've done in 4G and before? Absolutely. And and there's also things that we've taken from the past that we stopped using, um, like phase, and we've brought that back in because we feel that that's a better way of doing it. And and um, <clears throat> you know what works sometimes on paper, you know, when we go out to practice doesn't doesn't always give you exactly what you want. But actually, this time in in 5G, I, I think there's a lot to be celebrated, and how you know what what our expectations were when we were doing standards and tr- early trials to actually what what has landed. Okay. I want to I want to get because you're touching on the thing that we've um, banged on about on the pod a fair bit, and I want to get into. I've just got to say one of the uh, beers that um, Foggy brought <laughs> is a uh, Beaver Town Heavy Gravity, which I've never heard of it's before. Chewy. It's chewy. You having one at the moment? I. <laughs> Hazy IPA, six and a half percent, and I think in order to tackle a matter of this complexity, I need a, I need a chewy IPA. Um, so yeah, if you don't mind, uh, Ian, I'm just going to steer it onto that 5G thing. If you've got other stuff, feel free to bring it up. But you know, you, you touched on it, but just to sort of more sort of itemise the things we come up with. So our, it was just a sort of very much a stream of consciousness thing where we we're talking about 5G new radio, and we we're just going, what's so new about it, and in a specific way, I think the thing that holds up, and, and you've kind of preempted this already, the thing that holds up is, yes, over a five megahertz chunk of spectrum, you're constrained by the kind of the same rules, laws of physics, yep. um, that you, you have been... You can change them. <laughs> you can <he. laughs> um, uh, That you have been for, for years. So that was what led me to go, so what's so fucking new about it? Um, but... Then some of our correspondents, I don't know if you've listened to recent ones. Actually, I should, I should mention why you might not have listened to it. Because uh, you've been doing, like, pinball tournaments, That's right, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, this last um, weekend. Uh, yeah, before we go into that, I think it'd be interesting, because I don't want to forget to bring it up, because it's so interesting. Um, how many pinball tables you got at home? 21. 21. Now that, you know, he doesn't just like pinball a bit, does he? <laughs> Um, and uh, and you actually had a tournament, and you had people around your house, and but it's yeah. competitive, is it? Yes, yeah, so we had a, a what we call an FPA sanctioned tournament, which is the International Flipper Pinball Association. No so way, that's so like a dodgeball type yeah, of thing. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so are some of the players. Um, yeah. but, um, and and uh, we had three um, events, and, and you you kind of score world championship points, and and we had forty players at my house. I had a big marquee. Wow. We had burgers. We had we had. We, I, I bought. I mean, you you won't appreciate the f- the the type of beer. So I bought like 
35 boxes of Budweiser. <laughs> uh, they were all gone. Um, right. I had to get more beer. Thank God for Amazon delivering beer, because I'd be in trouble otherwise. It should be noted um, that um, Neil's bravely <coughs> drinking, given what's happened in the last couple of years, drinking Corona. So it's good to see Corona's back. Do you remember, two years ago, everyone stopped buying meme. Corona? There was a meme. There was like, uh, the Facebook, every meme was someone, look, Corona. <laughs> but then on the flip side, nearly went out of business, because everyone stopped buying it. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I like Mexican light beer. It's great Yeah, stuff. yeah. But, but, you know, Seoul was doing fine. You know, all those other ones. Mary Clark's keep. There, there right, great, yeah, by yourself. Um, you see that Vodafone Germany CEO left this week. <laughs> I did. But he put that LinkedIn post up, which I, I, maybe it was lost in translation, but there's this great quote where he says, I remember, he's like re- reminiscing on his time at the company. He goes, I remember how at the beginning we were all sitting helplessly in front of Corona. And I thought, I've been sitting helplessly in front of Corona for years. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me all about it, mate. So, um, why did I go from that? Oh, yeah, so you're pinball. Uh, so, did you win? Uh, I, I came so I, I came fourth in one one tournament and overall in the three tournaments I, I came ninth. So I how is it done? Is it is it like people presumably if you're comparing apples with apples, you've got to compete on one machine? No. So the way the way that, the way that we, we, we we use this term called match play. So people are split in you forty players. They're split into four groups, and each group you play each other on the same game and then you're scored and then you get laddered nice. depending on how good you are it's like conferences yeah and then you and then you um it's like golf match play golf and then and then you okay. play players that, that, that have scored the same as you in the next round i see <clears throat> and you go up and down tiers and yeah and if, if you're playoffs. if you're and then if you get if you're in the top um 16 at the end we have a, a kind of a, a sudden death sort of final where if you, you get knocked out and then the last guy standing wins the, the golden domino, is, which was the trophy. Golden domino? Uh, yeah, the why, golden domino. Why domino? Uh, so I'm... I'm, uh, I'm one of, of, one of the other golden pinball machine would be pretty <coughs> pricey. No, no, what, yeah, one of the other um, bizarre hobbies I've got is, is I like to study what's known as the domino effect. So something happens over yes. here. Well, like chaos theory here. type of thing. Yeah, well, it's not quite chaos. It's more systems. Oh, OK. So, more, more, more directly trackable <laughs> yeah, so, uh, sequences yeah, of events. Yeah, so if... if, right. if, if if you know, if you suddenly, you know, take ten people out of doing this, what happens to the other part of the system? So, Law of unintended consequences. Yeah, I've, and I've so and and it's kind of just been something that's that stuck with me forever. Basically, cool. Wasn't it like the there were a great famine in China where they tried to kill all the bats, but then the insects went rampant. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's like, that, I thought it's, it was a good idea. <laughs> it's that sort of systems thinking. It's like if you do this, what happens here? And mm. I, I studied it. it, it Which uh, is another know. argument in favour of uh, laissez-faire libertarians like me, in case I hadn't told you I'm a laissez-faire libertarian. <laughs> um, this should be a shirt, T-shirt. So, so, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of it going on during COVID. Let's do this. Libertarians. Yes. No, yeah. no. <laughs> no, libertarians were very not, much not in vogue during COVID. But no, what I mean is like this top-down control, this illusion of control, to think that, okay, this is a thing, we're going to deal with that, and that will sort it all out, and then there won't be knock-on effects and unintended consequences and that sort of thing. I mean, I suppose if you extrapolate it, ultimately, the flip side is just doing fuck all, which is not always a great option either. But there we go. But it can be the best thing to do. So sometimes. Pin- actually, so in pinball, if the ball's coming towards you, sometimes the best thing to do is actually not to flip and let the ball pass to the other flipper and get yes. control over it. So there's, there's again, sometimes actually doing nothing can is not always as bad as, as you might think. That's a good, that's a good but, answer. <clears throat> but, but the key thing is, is you've got to measure it and, 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 you know, if you can, simulate it. So, and we do, and actually we do that a lot of that in the network. We, you know, if we change our topology... And, and and we got models. Um, it will say, okay, the network got better, or it got worse, or it got more expensive, or it got least expensive, or this parameter changed. So mm. we're continually driving models to to show what the difference. To yeah, the and if makes. doing something makes things worse, then obviously doing then nothing you do is nothing better. Nothing is better. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so back to the back to the five G thing. So so we agree in terms of pure air interface and like for like over an identical bit of spectrum. Um, there's not a lot of difference. Is well, there's, that right? some, there's some there's some modulation differences, but but is it is it is it like a completely brand new thing? No, uh, I think it's fair to say. But I could argue that with every bit of radio that's come out since you know Marconi tuned in. Um, back, but we back, had a back, step back in the day. But we had a we had a step change in data rates with four G versus three G, didn't we? Um, to some extent. If Certainly, you think felt of like H- that on my phone. Well, if, if you think of three three G HDSPA, 
Yeah. Which was, you know, we were getting, you know, 40 meg, 50 meg from that at one point in time. Um, and that's, all, you know, that's all about, you know, how you safely allocate spectrum and leverage that spectrum and, and the scheduler and the radio is constantly I managing see. how that how that happens. That hasn't changed in terms of the schedule other than, other than <clears throat> because we've got more processing power, we can think about more things in the radio and most importantly from my perspective, the radio can actually tell us some more live, what, here's what's actually happening and then we can take, you know, we can take that data, play it back and say, okay, you know, one of our busiest, one of the busiest and hardest parts of, of running a network in the UK is the South Bank. Um, it's very busy during the summer when, when we've got tourists there. Me and Ian used to have romantic <coughs> walks there, didn't we? <laughs> when it was not very but during lockdown, when we can get to the pub, we just walk up and down the South Bank drinking, drinking beers. Beer. Or in one case, we did a whole bottle of Jameson's. <laughs> Um, and, and all whilst that, you, you had great, um, great connectivity. Oh, yeah. I, I remember, but, I remember yeah, marking. This is the fastest connection I've ever had in my life, I think. <laughs> yeah, we probably the only two people there at the time. But, but that, that part of the wall, that, that part of geography, you've got a river on one side that's just wide enough. That even if I put towers on the other side, it's not going to help me. Oh. So, you know, we, we get a lot more data from, from the radio and from the network to say, actually, what's the big, best configuration here? And, and some of the stuff in, in 5G and R helps us optimize that. It helps us get it more right. It helps us with kind of big crowds, which has always been a challenge is if they suddenly appear. And that's one of the things that 5G, <clears throat> as, we, as we build out more and more, you know, that notion of I've got five bars, but nothing's working. That isn't, that's because the schedulers, you know, really struggling to, to cope with thousands of users or tens of thousands actually. of users. I was a bit baffled. And, and, and it's, and it's, you know some of the things in 5G, particularly on the signalling side, really help us help us solve that problem. But the, I mean, one thing we heard, which I, I could expose my technical ignorance a lot here, but the, the actual waveform itself was quite a step change going from 3G to 4G. I think you had a yeah, yeah, FTM yeah, coming yeah. in, well, FDM and, 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 and 5G's yeah. pretty much just continued with that, hasn't it? It's run with the same thing. Yeah, right? and 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 because there's a lot more to extract from that, right? And I think if you want to if you want to change that then the whole tooling for lots of things has to change too. The, the devices, the radios. Um, so, and, and <clears throat> you know, this is, where the, this is where the interest in overlap between technologies come in, especially if you're a, a, a fixed and mobile organisation. So we've been using some of those, those um, modulations in the fixed network for years. And in the mobile network, we've been using things like MIMO and that we've taken out of mobile, put into fixed, and take some stuff out of fixed and put into to mobile. And 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 actually we're surprised, wow, this works the same way. Well, why wouldn't it? It's physics. So that you know, that's where when we look at the fixed network and we say, okay, here's where the mobile network's headed, actually this what we've got, that'll work great. Why change it? It's just expense, it's just change for change sake, let's keep it as it is. And we know, you know, so the mobile network today in the UK, you know, we're about one terabit a second at peak. On the fixed network, we're 20 or 30 times that. So we know that we've got a long journey on the technology that we've got to, to before we have to really go out there and change it in, in a way that probably isn't going to bring significant benefits to anybody. So, um, you know, they're, they're, the, the, it, it goes back to that point I made earlier on about, you know, where we invest and where we don't and what we get right and what we don't and ensuring that we're on the right side of the line. And I think... And radio, I mean, I, <clears throat> I look at the radio side of the network almost entirely separately from the core network side. And, and what I believe is, is you know, and, and if you look at it, <clears throat> on the radio, we should, we're probably at, I don't know, 10G. You could argue that we're at 10G because we've done certain things in radio that don't align to what we've done in the core network. So, uh, you know, and the radio will evolve and continue to evolve whilst, you know, the core network actually stays pretty much the same. And and, and one of the things I believe in, I know this this is a, a an amusing topic for many, which is in, <clears throat> which is in 6G, <clears throat> which, which I personally challenge where there now is the right time to be thinking about that. But how do we decouple those two things so that we can continue to involve the, evolve the radio and get more out of radio as more processing comes along, as we get more ability to schedule, as we get more ability to control the radio, whilst actually keeping the core network pretty much as it is because we've done it. And 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 I think there's a there's a there's a bit of thinking that we need to do to do that. And actually, that's where 
to some extent, Open RAN has helped because it has kind of put a bit of focus on that aspect of the network that probably wouldn't have got that as much the focus. Run. Yeah, but, as, as much focus as, but, but as on it the is radio now. side with six G. I have heard people say that it might. I mean, you're saying OFTM. There's still a lot of still has a lot of legs in Absolutely. there, and therefore, I think it was even. Howard Watson actually at uh, Mobile World Live was uh, Mobile World Live, Mobile World Congress. Don't want to mention Mobile World Live, but uh, no, no. Um, <laughs> boo. <laughs> at, uh, we'll edit that out later. Mobile World Congress was saying he thought thinks six G would probably just be not not a new air interface. You know, it would be the same <clears throat> thing that we've used with five G. So if the core network's not really, ch I mean, what do, what is six G then really? Is it just pushing it into new spectrum bands, or is it? <clears throat> I mean, is it needed at all? <clears throat> is it, I mean, my, I mean, look, I think. Um, the notion, here's my take, is, is the notion of us, us all being focused for this kind of magic 5G badge that we all have to launch and who's going to be first and is it going to work? Um, is that a stress that we need? I'm, I'm uncertain about that, right? Um, however, it's hard to argue that in some parts of what we do that that has pushed us to, to do more and more. It's like, it is, a, it is like a, well, we've got, to, we've got to do this, we've got to deploy it. I think if you look at the network... Um, you know, when 5G came out, there was still a lot of life in 4G, and there's and to some extent, we're, you know, we still use it. But, you know, quite a big chunk of the UK is still only 4G, um, <clears throat> and and as we build out 5G, 5G is bringing us an ability to to scale the network and get more out of it, and especially these big, big, bigger frequency or higher frequency bands where we need some of the capabilities to to get the most out of them. So. Uh, the same will be true for any other generation, um, but but I think I think we need to be more um, more intelligent about how we label it. You know, is it six G or do we want to think about it differently? Do we want to think about? We actually, won't be though, will we? We won't be more intelligent <laughs> about it. You, when we get towards the end of this decade, it's going to be rinse and fucking repeat, isn't it? <laughs> Well, I like to think not, Scott, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm like a, I'm a, I'm a trained, adapted Scott that was very cynical. That's trying to trying to be more positive. You're like, trying to be more positive. No, <clears throat> but it's not even cynical. It's, it's just, it's just Groundhog Day. It's what we've it's always hard. done. It's yeah, hard absolutely. to imagine hard to us change. stopping doing what we've always I done. One hundred percent agree. I, I, but I think, you know, I, I think that the needs of different, po you know, I talk about networkification, right? The, the, the. the and I'll say this loosely, so lots of people will, will want to beat me for it, but the easy part of that was we'll stick a few macros out and we'll just blast the place with radio. Job done. The harder part is, is okay, I need to get radio into a tunnel where trains go. I need to get radio onto planes so that people can be connected when they move. I need to get radio into every part of the country onto an oil rig. You know, and, and I think we need to think about, you know, how, how, we, how might we shape the future so that we've got the right focus on those big difficult challenges rather than just more blast it from the from 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 big towers which which has been you know a bit of our focus but actually that's turns out that's where we make most money and that's where most of our customers are so it's also right as well but you, you, oh, go on. I, was, I was just going to say that, that you know the 5G seems to have been accompanied by this huge sort of investment splurge, I guess, not just because of the, of the expense of some of the like mobile equipment, but it, but there's also this big fibre build-out going on and a need for the backhaul and the optical and all the other stuff. That you, it all seems to have come together in a way at the same time, this huge project. I mean, do you, do you think we're now, you know, when you look forward to whether, whether there's 6G or not in, in sort of 2028, 29, 30, are we... You know, is there is there an opportunity for the for there to be sort of less capital intensity, I guess, in the business, and and to look at spending money on something else, and not have to sort of worry about the fact that you've got to dig up roads and you've got this huge. So, you know. so I mean, look, I think you know, when we've when we've put fibre to every building, that's done. It's it, you know, and, and <clears throat> I think if you were to flip back 150 years to or 175 years, which so last year was BT's 175th birthday. Um, and you look at the people who were building telegraphs, you know, they're probably thinking, we're going to put this in every single house. And for 175 years, that'll God, be the core. 175 years? We've been doing be telecoms for 175 years? We have years. indeed, yes. Damn. Um, we, we will be using that infrastructure for that amount of time. Yes, we've updated it, we've modernised it, we've ripped some of it out, we've replaced it. The fibre that we're building today, you know, it's hard to see what comes along to replace that. Yeah. And, and you know, for me, that's, you know... Uh, 
you know, in, in investment life cycles, you know, they're very short because investors have got a, a period of time they want to get return on it, which, which you know, as we're all investors in some respect, we all, we all want to see a return. But the fibre will go on for years after that, mm. you know, and, and it will be a great foundation for us to then build, um, you know, more and more services and capabilities out there. So, you know, well, we've, I got, think we've got 150 years out of copper, haven't we? Yeah, well, uh, uh, copper and other technologies. Your radio as well was, has been around, and and, but and some satellites. copper that some copper that was that was <clears throat> that still used today presumably was laid a hell of a long time ago. Well, yeah, or it's been some of it will have been refreshed and, okay. and replaced. But but ultimately, the core asset of of and, and actually with fiber, we don't need to do that. It's it once it's it done, doesn't, you, you it doesn't really need to degrade. you really need to touch it. Yeah. Right. So the the <clears throat> the beauty of that is is that when you know if we go six G, and and I like you know, when I say the next evolution I'm, I'm i'm going to try and avoid calling it 6g because it just generates momentum for that when we go to the next when you when don't we, want to thing. <laughs> when we go to the i'm on record of of, of saying mm, really um so okay um when, when, we're, scoop, on, <laughs> when we're on rec when, when we're looking at um you know the new mod the new radio spectrums that come along so you know we we've got our um terahertz terahertz we've got but even 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 millimeter wave you know that yeah. is not well deployed um that fiber foundation will make that a hell of a lot easier to to get the most from so you know it's it's a case of you know we're putting some really important core infrastructure at a time where it's become more affordable and actually we see a demand for it you know so you know i've been looking at the de i've been looking at the demand for fiber for a long time and when you look at the usage of of most people at home with broadband you know few people go above 40 or 50 meg yeah, hmm. we're all, everyone's rushing out to sell them a one gig service, right? And and there are there are businesses and home users that that love that. Like, so I was streaming my pinball tournament and having lo I've got um, the amazing BT fiber at home, and and it's great to have that to be able to stream to to Twitch. And, and if you're a media con uh, a media developer that's working at home and you want to do video, having having that sort of bandwidth is really helpful. Um, but for a lot of people, it's you know it, it's you know the up to 100 meg is actually perfectly fine for them but what we're now starting to see in the network is more and more of that ceiling be hit so now is the right time for us to go build build these fiber services because we're starting to see a demand for it whereas even in 2017 we weren't seeing a network demand for it you know yeah. how many people really maxed <clears throat> out their broadband line for more than five minutes hardly anyone does that so now we're starting to see it more driven by some of these big you know big video games like uh, call of duty um and and some of the streaming services and also you know you got a family of five um guaranteed they're all on ipads watching different stuff and i can and confirm if, that yeah I've, I've 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 got two grandkids and, and they watch different stuff on their ipads and you know i see the the, the they look the old enough to have two grandkids now uh, well, I do. They're uh, Theo and Amelia, and they're both brilliant. Uh, cool. um, so the 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 the, um, the 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 needs of the family and the needs of the family of the future, and and if we do more with putting the network into places it's never been before, the more the need for that fiber and the more the need for that for that capability. So you know. Building fiber. I mean, the minute I turned up at BT, I've been working at BT just just over ten years. I was like, you know, okay, let's start working on our fiber case. And everyone's like, really? I was like, yeah, because eventually we're going to need it. Let's be ready for it. Well, well, I mean, it's more of a market question, really. But you're obviously not the only ones building fiber out. There's 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 lots going on at the moment, and it just seems like you look at the amount of companies that have a fiber project somewhere. There must be parts of the country where you've got maybe three or four options. I don't know if that's the case, but. Do you, do you have a sort of idea of how many is is sort of economically feasible, or you know, because it just there's going to be a lot of wasted fibre, isn't there? It so, seems. And, yeah, I mean, look, yeah. if you've got, you know, if you've got fibre into your house, do you need someone else's fibre? Um, probably not. Um, but I do think competition is important because it keeps you know, and the way that you talk about you talked about being regulation being important, I hundred percent agree with that. I want you know, because I want competition because. Um, I personally don't get out of bed to be second. So I want to be able to come into work, do a brilliant job with the team and say we're the number one network, which we are, by the way, um, and be proud of that and give our customers what they need um, as opposed to it being, well, it's just as, you know, this, this, there's only one place we can get it and they're rubbish. And you go to the US, 
that's what people have got. And and yeah. when, I, when 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 they come, so I had a guy from Texas who was at my pinball tournament. and He's on my Wi-Fi. He's like, Neil, this Wi-Fi is insane. And he's like, and he's only got one choice. Should be. And yeah. So you don't get one choice, so it's shite. Because there's no there's no imperative for Verizon or AT and T or ever to deliver a better service because yep. there's no competition. No, totally. So you say uh, you got number one network by by what criteria is that? Uh, well, every single one. Every single one. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that shut me up, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it's not me that says. No, that. no. I'm it's just everybody wondering. else. It's just a natural journalistic instinct when someone makes a claim <laughs> to ask them to substantiate it. Yeah, if you uh, say, you, you can, if you go at e, e.co.uk. <laughs> You, yeah. and, and have a good read. You is that, will, you is that will, root metrics though? They always put BT th- there's, at, the, there's, e at the top. There's well, loads of loads of other um, metrics that say the same enough, thing. Like what what is the top whatever. speed then on the on the sort of because I've got fibre to, I've got BT as well, but I, I, I don't have a fibre to the home option at the moment. Um, so it's I think it's seventy six or something. Yeah, so, which is so more on, than enough that we need actually. Yeah, so, but, so um, seventy. So got one fifty. On, on yeah, FTTC, go on. it's so we got, we got kind of three products for four products in the market. So on fiber today, you can up to, have up to a 900 megabit service, that's right. what I've got at home. Um, or you can stagger it down, you can have 500 meg. You know, we, there's lots of different tierings, and both B- BT Consumer and the other CPs that use the Open Reach network offer lots of different um, speeds and tiers depending on, on what you need. On, on um, our NGA platform, FTTC. It goes up to 76 meg. We've also got GFast that we rolled into some places, which will do up to about 300 megabits per second. And it's and it's focused on... We, we kind of put that in some areas where we knew we would need more speed and, and our ability to get fibre there would, would take too long. Um, but as it turns out, the pace that we needed to go fibre was just, you know... We kind of realised actually we need to go faster and farther on fibre, and we kind of pivoted. Um, so GFast is going to be that. fairly short lived, really. As it, as no, it I happens. think it'll be around for a while, but yeah. but I don't think we're going to expand it yeah. much to where the footprint is today. I, I I'm you know I'm not um, specifically involved in, in how OpenReach think about that, but I look at it and think it's hard to see when you know when the world is moving to fibre. This this is a good um, interim step, but actually. Mm. If you take an interim step, you just divert money from actually what you want to build, which is fibre. Yeah. But you know, I'll say this: you know, we, we got a lot of challenge on on FTTC. People say you should be building fibre, but let me tell you, the whole country ran on that FTTC platform through the pandemic, yeah. and the people that put the effort into building that kept this country running. I'm super proud of it. I see, you know, we see the network stats: people using the, the network from eight in the morning till eight at night. You know, we flattened the day, whereas before the network would be busy when people got home, and we did all that on that platform. And if you can, if if you if in, I'll leave you guys to reflect on this because it's it's your trade. But you know, who was complaining about challenges with broadband in the UK? What you mean in terms of just data and, rates and yeah, access and, 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 and in other parts of other parts of the world, it was not so straightforward. So I think we did a fantastic job there. Um, I think we're fairly well served by broadband. I, I was probably complaining country. about it in a sort of RC way in articles, but <laughs> yeah. you know. but but I mean that I mean those stats went up a lot, didn't they? I think that there was an article by um, Mark Alera, I think, saying that the peak was some, something ridiculous, like twenty seven terabits a second, terabits when a they second, had a bunch yeah. of Premier Premier League football matches on at the same time yep. on Amazon, and then I think before the pandemic it was much much lower than that well so is I it still going up now or is it tailed off is it is it changing at all now that we're sort of coming out of the pandemic or so um, what the so the pandemic did two things um it extended the bandwidth day as we call it so before the bandwidth day we kind of start um four o'clock everyone's going home on the train they're on their mobile they're trying to catch up with Wimbledon or, or they're trying to do something and, as, as they head home and then when you get home you move to Wi-Fi or you turn your TV on and then and then there's the, the, the busy video hour which is everyone watching TV from kind of 6 till midnight and and that's the big peak with with um, with the pandemic that kind of extended to start in the morning so people you know kids that were at home from were either on teams doing schoolwork or they were watching TV or they were playing video games and and, and that really pushed extended that day but actually for us that was quite easy to cope with because we had the we had, we had this peak in the evening and catching those those other um traffic um growth during the day we already had the capability to do that um very simple very straightforward what uh, and then what we're seeing now is is we still see a lot of daytime traffic and there's people continuing to work from home 
Um, and, and, and what we've seen is it's probably a slight slowdown in growth because the only thing you could do during the pandemic was watch TV you know, or play video games. But now people are back out and about, they're going to theatres, they're, they're, they're travelling. So the, the kind of growth of that slowed down a little bit. Is there still growth? Absolutely. Um, and in and, and the mobile network, you know, we actually saw a little bit of shrinkage because people are at home using Wi-Fi. Since, you know, the, um, last year we started to see the mobile network grow again quite significantly. And as, as people start buying new devices and, move, and, and they're 5G enabled, we're starting to see... The, the speed of 5G drive new bandwidth. So I was on a, a train coming from Croydon into London. The train had a problem. I was stuck there. I downloaded a Top Gear episode in about two seconds. I was able to watch it right on my phone. As you know, that for me, you know, people say, what's well, the use case of 5G? That's one there right away. So I was able to do something. Is that old Top Gear or new Top Gear? Old Top Gear for right. sure. No one, watches <laughs> new, no one uses, no one watches new Top he's on, Gear. He's on the new one now. I don't even know who does it anymore. But there used to be a, Matt LeBlanc did There used to be a tech journalist. I've forgotten his name, but no, when they first did it. Yeah, anyway. It's terrible, the new one. Right. Um, but you can't argue with Chris uh, Harris. You can't Chris argue. Harris. Yeah, Chris is okay. I like Chris, but the rest of them. Nobody just started watching Paddy the McGuinness. Grand Tour. What does he know about cars? Yeah. I mean, people God. just went to the Grand Tour, didn't they? Instead, on yeah. Amazon. So um. there is something about that Clarkson brand, like it or hate it. I mean, he is <laughs> he's, he's, he's the man in that I space, it isn't it? His, his yeah. farm program's fantastic. Yeah, I know, I've heard that's huge as well. It's, 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 I've uh, never if watched you it. Haven't seen it. You gotta watch it. It's quite, fantastic. It's very funny, and it's just him <laughs> sort of being Clarkson, but in a farm setting. Yeah, yeah. basically, but taking it quite seriously. It's called Diddley Squat. Yeah, but he buys this kind of Lamborghini tractor. Right, of which course is, he yeah. does. Which is totally and, inappropriate. And, and which was that, originally, originally it was a tractor brand, yeah, wasn't yeah. it, before they started exactly. making... And, 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 and from the minute I saw that, I was like, right, I'm watching this. Right. <laughs> and he's just trying to sort of burn it around a field. Yeah, I just... And there's this I mean, guy called Caleb, isn't there? He's yeah. like a young farmer who's just like having a go all the time about what an idiot he is and he doesn't have a clue what he's doing. I mean, he is again. actually... If, if you, when you look at the show, he is actually the star of the show, that yeah. guy. And I hope... hope it's I hope, Caleb. Yeah, I think right. he's, I hope. I hope they've um, well, they're doing given a big load of cash and chained him out for a while. Definitely check it out. My son, when he was when he was a little kid, he absolutely loved Top Gear, and I think it was mainly because of the personalities of the guy. So I'll have to flag that up to him. That farm thing, it it's very him up. very good. Um, we got. Sorry, were you about? To I, ask I, I was only. I was going to. I mean, as we're talking about access technologies, I was because we talked a, a bit about it before offline. But I was going to ask you about satellite and yeah. where, where that fits in, because because BT's obviously done seems to have done things that I've not tracked closely with people like OneWeb, and <clears> you know, I just. I'm kind of interested to know what you think as well about Elon Musk's sort of attempts with with Starlink to, to yeah, get I mean, that so, off the ground. So and Luke, literally, um, and <laughs> th- <laughs> one I of think, his phallic rockets. <laughs> I think um, I mean SpaceX have done an epic job. I mean those the, I've been to, I've met with them in my kind of geek rocket fan. You know, it's where the two worlds world. collide, isn't it? Yeah, and and for me that's super exciting. Mm. Um, but the the you know Starlink actually I've got it at home. Um, it, a, apart from it being quite expensive, it's a pretty decent service. Now, so, so you buy the dish, do you? Yeah, and you buy the about, dish. It's like when you used to get Sky back in the 80s. Yeah, well. and, and so the dish is about, I don't know, 500 quid-ish. Right. You just stick the dish out there and make sure there's nothing above it. I mean, just stick it in the middle of your garden if you've got one, or yeah. I've got it on the, the side roof of my house, and it's got a Wi-Fi thing that's not so great, um, so I've I've dispatch that and plugged into a BT home hub which is far better um, <laughs> skillfully and, done so and, um, and um, Halo 6 and, and, and in effect so I've got three choices at home so I can I can fail over to um, 4G or 5G or I can fail over to Starlink and and I mean I bought it I'm, in, I'm a networking guy I've got to buy it. I've got to understand how this thing works mm, that's yeah. why I, I bought it um, and, and I've said I was impressed by it but you know, and I, I basically moved my whole house to use it for a week to see actually how would this how would this actually perform, um, and it's really annoying because it stops performing at the really crucial Teams meeting where you're about to mm. say something that's really important and you disappear, <laughs> um, and and it's still got those sort of challenges. It's a bit but jittery. but if you're if you're in a place, you know, there's there's a couple hundred thousand places in the UK that it's either really difficult to build to or really expensive to build to. If you're in yeah. one of those locations, Starlink and OneWeb is absolutely an option for you. That's like sort of eight, question rural Wales and Northern yeah. Scotland or something 80 like that. 80 megs down, right? Uh, I, I got 160 meg down. Wow. Um, the latest, I mean, I'm a gamer, so I, as well as pinball, I play other games. Oh, you? You can, what do you play? 
pretty much everything. Pretty much every, have you ever played Dota 2? Uh, I'm aware of it, yeah. I don't uh, think I've played it. That's, that's the one I've Day of the... No, it uh, stands for Defence of the Ancients. It's, ah. the most, um, it's the most lucrative e-sport one. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, it's basically you you're looking top down. And it's not like these first person yes, shooter things. It's, it's a RPG type game. That's it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, that sort of thing. I, I play shooter games, basically. You're more FPS yeah, kind of so, guy. Um, okay, you uh, get on well with my son. I'll bring him around <laughs> for the next pod. Um, so, I, I am. And, 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 and playing, playing, you know, games on the Starlink probably, probably not going to get you the world championship, let's say. But, mm. but you know, as again, or as a, as a, as, you know, Leo's as a backup service for sure. It's, it's capable. And, and what we're doing one web, um, is, um, a couple of things. One is, we, um, we have a mobile network that's that we also have emergency services on uh, that they we're moving towards. And we have a requirement to provide um, availability that even if I build three fibers to a location, that still might be challenged. So we use satellite technology as a backup for some of yeah. the key p pieces Ultimate of the network. Of so that's you know it'll it'll support a voice and some some data services. So that in an emergency, that we've got a, a backup solution that works beautiful for that. And um, but we're also looking at as a, an alternative backhaul where we might be able to build. In a village, or in a in a town, or in or in some other part of of the country, but the backhaul part of it is difficult or expensive, or or whatever the challenges are. Actually, let's drop drop um, a, a one web terminal in, connect it via that, and then as we see the demand increase for the services, then a case that we would never have got over the line based on our best thinking, all of a sudden becomes actually. Now we now that we've got fifty customers here, let's also build fibre to it. So it allows us to experiment in in geographies where we're uncertain of the demand, we're uncertain of the thank you, we're uncertain of where it's going to go. And and you know for me that's great. And and the great thing about Leo's is is the the technology is evolving constantly. So you know the the first wave are, is is impressive. You know OneWeb's had some challenges because of the Russia situation, but they're on top of them. Um, shifting to and, India right? and um, India and, and yeah. also using SpaceX um, um, but the guys you know the guys there at, at OneWeb I've, I've also spoken to some of their other customers they have a forum and you know the customers they're working with are people in Alaska um, Canada where you know the geography is huge I mean in every part of the country here in the UK there's a not spot somewhere and and you know I look at it Ideally, I'd put fiber and 5G to every one of those. Some of them, you, you know, because it's the environment you can or the location. So I want to put, again, I go back to my earlier point, I want to get people connected. If Leo's are a way of doing that and, it, and it's, you know, economically feasible and it works and the experience is good, why the hell wouldn't I use them? Do you, do you think it's economically feasible for the companies doing it, though? I mean, Star I've always Starling wondered about, about the about business model. Is, I mean, I think Elon Musk at Mobile World Congress last year, when it wasn't proper Mobile World Congress, it was just sort of people on Zoom calls, but he was <laughs> he was saying we're sort of targeting 2% of the world's unconnected and the satellite dish costs $500, as you're saying, and, and the services. Really and you're sort of thinking, well... Some of these people living in rainforests and up mountains aren't multi-millionaires or whatever, and they don't have lots of money to afford it. I mean, can they? And the costs are huge, aren't they, to put these things up? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, Luke, it's not. I, I take your point. Right now, it looks expensive, but let me tell you, it doesn't get any cheaper unless you go out and build it. And I think what what he, what someone like Musk is saying is okay. When you know he looks at everything he's done, when he built his, I don't know if you remember his original Teslas that were on Lotus chassis, they were insanely expensive, but it allowed him to prototype it, improve it, and drive the benefits so that by the time he's launching the proper car, actually I can sell it at a price where people will buy it. If he hadn't done that work in, in mm. with, with with the chassis that he had, he would never have got there. So my patient capital. Well, you've, it is a long term investment, but you know this our our business ultimately, you know, we're not. You know, we've been here for 175 years. I predict we'll be here for another 175 years. So we are here for a long time. It, yep. It's a challenge, and you know, as investors, of course, so we got enough bears for that. They want. <laughs> I don't know. Um, as as <laughs> hey, we, we, this, this is, if we're ever going to do it, it's today. <laughs> um, is, that, is, is, that, is that some sort of like I'm yakking too much? No, not no, at all. Okay, not at all. It's, just, um, it's just me being. I do my love normal. the sound of my own voice. No, it's just me being my usual flippant you. self. No. That's all. Um, the, but the, I mean, that, that's how I see it, and I think you know they've got Gen Two coming, um, which will take a bunch of cost out, and um, and the same way that, that many other Leo guys working. I, I actually went to 
there's a satellite conference that's in Washington um, every year. I went to that for the first time, and and actually. Uh, what I took away from it was is there was a lot to learn that I didn't know about satellite. So I've been spending a bit of time learning what more I could use this type of technology for because satellite was kind of put in the cupboard as old, dusty, doesn't is slow, doesn't not you know. But actually, yeah. there's I think there's a lot more to satellite than than we've given credit for. I I, I agree with you. You know, I've I've often pondered pondered the uh, business model. Yeah, and I'm not about to second guess Musk because he seems to have some sort of superhuman brain going on there. Uh, and obviously Tesla turned into something that nearly went bankrupt loads of times to something that's just kicking ass, certainly on its share price. And you see, you actually see it's just, profitable in the UK. You actually see a fair few of them kicking around now. Um, so I'm not about to second guess. And he's changed the market. You know, no one was building electric cars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, everyone's, no got everyone's building electric cars. Yeah. yeah. And also, he anticipated that the sort of current ecomania, which I don't think is necessarily, uh, and I'm not going to go off on this tangent now because we certainly don't have time for that, isn't necessarily best served by electric cars because obviously you still got to generate the but electricity. Absolutely. He's not under any illusions that satellite now is not going to be some something that reaches every person, which is what they were doing in the year 1999, yeah. too, with, with yeah. things like Iridium and Teledesic. Yeah. So the the really business early. plans are very different. He's, so He's being really early and he's a, a person who has the ability to not only sort of follow through a vision earlier than most people would have the balls to, because a lot of it, I'm sure there are lots of people, clever sort of um, strategic types who can see it coming, but it's another matter making it happen now. It's a bit like what Neil was saying about sort of fibre. You know, in hindsight, you could have just got tons and tons of investment and built out loads of fibre. Yeah, a lot of it would have been redundant for a while, it would have been underused, but you're going to use it sooner or later, so why not just build a fucking thing out? straight away but there's certain economic realities isn't there to to sort of investing massively in something that doesn't yield dividends until decades down the line but musk seems to be one of these people that does it and he brings investors along with him and uh yeah and and and, and the other thing that neil said that made me think you know another part of the business model yes there's um un- there's there's remote communities and that sort of thing but that redundancy play struck me as quite sensible you know if if been if someone useful is in Ukraine, actually, you are. Yeah. yeah, well, it's been especially useful yeah. in Ukraine. But even in less sort of dramatic environments like that, someone like as Neil was saying with the, with the emergency services stuff, where where obviously both in terms of your SLA and your moral obligation, the thing needs to never go down. You've got to build in several layers of redundancy. I would yeah, have thought. 100%. Yeah, so that will make sense. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to before we move on because we've been chatting for over an hour already, and I want to chat about some other sort of newsy stuff. But I just want to square off the 5G thing that I keep sort of threatening to talk about. So I think where we've got so far is, yes, in terms of pure interface, pure air interface, not a massive difference. But yes, there's all, there's all these other things that you mentioned right near the start of the pod about things like sort of massive MIMO and beam forming and clever things that have to be done in order to make better use of this spectrum that has been made available or... I mean, this is something I got from correspondence to, uh, to our previous stuff. You know, there's no reason why that spectrum technically couldn't have been used by 4G. Yeah. But from what I gather in the, in the, in the standard, the being able to use sort of mid-band and millimeter wave just wasn't there. So it's not so much necessarily a product of some unique special source within 5G. There's almost a sort of coincidence of time that these stars have all aligned at the same moment, such that we're now able to use these much larger bits of spectrum real estate in the mid-band and then in millimetre wave in a way that we weren't before. So I get all that, but there's just one other thing I want to pick up on before we move it on. You're talking about how, like, in in RAN, we, we could, you could say we're in 10G as, as opposed to core. Um, but I, again, you know, this is, this is just me, a dilettante journalist, but I got the impression that a big part of the special source in 5G was the core. Yeah. When you're talking about things like... Um, uh, network slicing yep. and and automation and all that clever stuff. So just, before we move it on, could you just sort of address that? What is what is special about five G in, in the sort of non RAN environment that maybe we've been underplaying <clears throat> when we've been yeah. dissing five G? So, so um, you know, if you look at the the key kind of what was, you know when we looked at five G, we were like, okay, what problems are we trying to solve? So one was low latency. Being able to prioritize traffic through the network so that you could have predictable performance. 
Yeah. Right, that crucially important in, in any kind of mission critical, it has to be predictable. Especially right? about surgery. Yes, <laughs> and shaving. <laughs> um, yes. But but um, and and, and being able shaving. and being able to say, you know, your application <coughs> saying, hey, I need this cap- I need this type of connectivity for this amount of time, and it needs to be this good. Five G gives you that. There was no way of doing that in any of the previous um, technologies. So, so you, you couldn't do network slicing on four G. Well, you could do network slicing to some extent, but it would be far less um, tunable, if you like. You, instead of instead of being able to fine tune some of the details, you'd you'd, you'd kind of have big chunks of it. Um, right. to, you know, you might have. Um, top quality, middle quality, low quality, as opposed to something a bit more sophisticated around what well, we bespoke. need. Yeah. We need low latency and we need high bandwidth, and 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 there's just more things in the core network and in the whole signalling layer that allows you to do that. And also, the other key thing was pulling the signal. We, I mentioned this earlier, but pulling the signal layer out of the data data transmission allows us to protect that signalling traffic. And, and add more redundancy, add more scalability to it, so that as you're signaling the network to have that really important path, that the really important path doesn't impact the signaling. So in, in 4G, we definitely couldn't do that. And, and, and if you look at any major mobile network outage, you know, you'll hear, oh, so-and-so have had a big problem. The biggest challenge is when you turn it back on and every Joe reconnects. Right. Because the network goes, oh, and, and, and what you have to do is is you have to go, okay, we'll have this one on, we'll have this one on, we'll have this one on, we'll have this one Staggering. on. Otherwise, you, you cause your own denial of service attack. With 5G, uh, we've got much more control over that. Is that just clever software? Yeah, I, yeah I'm, but I mean, all pretty much all the signaling is all has has been software yeah. and is soft and, and is software um, since we moved from three G to four G and, e, and even in three G there's there's a lot of software driving it. So it's it's some of it's more important. Um, some of it's more you know different software. Some of it's um, being able to allocate more resources around that signaling layer, and then and then that then also allows you to say, um, I need high availability. So in a, in a network slice where you've got high availability, you might signal the whole network, including the fixed network that's got all the broadband, sorry, all the backhaul in it, you will signal the network to say, I want path A and I want path B, and I'm going to transmit on both. And if one of the paths goes, that's all right, I've got the other one. Or you might have five paths. And, and again, um, you could do that in 4G, but it was really difficult. It was really clunky, and your ability to manage it was quite difficult. With with 5G, there's a whole bunch of management in the network that allows you to manage those slices um, differently. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical about network slicing cards on the table because I, I'm 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 always very nervous of things that introduce complexity unless there's a really really big win from that complexity. Makes sense. So so what we are doing is is making those um, where we need to use that slicing capability. Okay, let's measure what the the difference is in doing that and how much effort or how much extra things we need to take care of. But the great news is, is and, and uh, you know I've spoken to this before. Initially, one of the one of the in my mind one of the terrible things five G did was to, was dictate what infrastructure you had to run it on, which was NFV. Um, you, you had to virtualize it, and I was like, why is why am I being told what how I want to run this. That really, I'll be honest with you, it pissed me off beyond belief, right? It's like, no, I'll decide that because you don't know what my market is. Because I'm the goddamn are. chief architect, not Hell you. Hell yes, that's right. <laughs> so that, that and, and actually I think in hindsight, that's one of the reasons why it's taken 5G a bit longer to get momentum because we were all building our, our NFV platforms. That's proven to be a lot harder than most people realise. The complexity there's massive. However, now we've got cloud native, which is proper... Um, virtualization where you can control the memory, the CPU, the disk, the I.O. with whatever whatever levers you want. You can have a lot of CPU and hardly any I.O. You can have a load of I.O. and hardly any disk. And Cloud Native really gives you much more control over the the whole application of running a 5G network. And, and that then allows you to run these slices easy. But is it, I mean... Is some of this 
because I've heard some people express scepticism because of the sort of demand side of it. You know, it's not something that someone's going to come out and ask for as a network slicing service, but they presumably yeah, would come I don't come think anyone's going to phone our sales desk but, but, and say, I'd like a slice. <laughs> to me, but, but to me, it's always been about SLAs, isn't yeah, it? They'll I, well, come and SLAs, ask for an SLA that you couldn't do before, perhaps. Predictability, yes, right. for sure. And, and you know, there are certain, again, you know, in my vision for, for the world is, is that the network's helping us um, do more and more of the the menial tasks of life, and we're we're off there and enjoying you know the, the the brighter things of life, and and to do that you've got to have certain types of pre- predictability. You've got to you know the the you've got to be able to know that the network's there, it's working as it should do, and it's providing what the capabilities are. And um, both network slicing gives us some of that capability, but there's a bunch of other things that we've put in the network around telemetry that allow us to sh- to actually see. What's, what the performance really is, because you know if 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 you're watching video, you, you know what? How do you? What's the what's the monitor that you're trying to be sure is is working? It's your eyeball. Are you seeing the video and the quality level that you want? And to actually know that it's really difficult. So, you know, this is where we're starting to use things like AI to actually map out when the, we know the network runs well when we see this pattern. When we see this pattern, we know something broke in Glasgow. And and that's where we're trying to trying to leverage technologies like AI. But we're, again, very early days. Um, but at BT Labs, uh, where, where, where Professor Tim Whitley runs it for us, he's got a team just focused on that topic because we think that's, as the network gets more complex, humans can't run it. You know, mm. we'll, we'll, there'll be like a green light and occasionally we'll press a button, but the network is... 100% going to be automated and if you're not thinking that then oh, you're no. probably Skynet dead. I mean, you have, yeah. like Skynet you, mate. Does that, does that, too, that's, what, that's where uh, he <laughs> came in. That, does that mean the size of the team goes down a lot then when 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 we get to that point that we don't, don't need that? Don't that's your last so. follow up by the way. I, I, don't, I need to move it on. I don't, oh, right. I don't <laughs> think so because I think there's other things that we need to do. So yeah. what I want to have is a team of, of uh, is my team of engineers going out into hospitals into um, different use cases and helping them bring the power of the network because it's really you know I, we say oh we want to do a use case here um, in you know Pirelli tires for example I don't know what how they make them I've got no idea about that but do I believe that there's some network thing that could make it better for them hundred percent so I want to I want to put people at that end of the network rather than kind of have them in the engine room kind of doing us doing a Scotty on it Scotty <laughs> on that note um, sorry to butt in I know no. <clears throat> I, look I, I hope you'll come back one day because I don't think we could chat about all this stuff forever for sure and, and it's, if, if, it's if really like me if you're <laughs> Okay, I'm just yeah. kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I seem to remember you took matters in your own hands, but there we go. Um, <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's really good. You know, even though I've been a telecoms journalist for eight years, you know, I've always felt, and I, I don't even feel bad about it, I've always felt like a dilettante, I've always felt like a messenger rather than any kind of expert. But I suppose you have to learn a thing or two just to be able to be a messenger. You've got to know what level. questions to ask, right? You've got to know what questions to ask, and you've got to know how to frame more complicated answers at, at least, and try and put them to words of one syllable. And, and um, yeah, I think what, you know, with respect to the um, the 5G thing that we've been obsessing about, your the, the conversation we had with you sort of confirmed some of the impression I was getting from other correspondents to the pod, which is, yes, you're sort of right, but it's fucking complicated. Yeah. Um, I think the real the real thing, and I'm looking for a response to this. In fact, I actively encourage you not to, because I'm trying to move it on. Um, <laughs> is that it's it's tough. I, I sympathise, and you touched on this earlier, it's tough for telcos and it's tough for telco marketing and sort of commercial people because what you're, you're selling an immensely complicated, involved, arcane thing, but then you're trying to sell it to normal people. Yeah. Uh, and which is where we get the silly use cases on TV and, you know, landing a plane from your living room and all that sort of thing, yeah, and the shaving on top of a mountain. Um, but, you know, I get it. You know, I'll take the piss, but I also get the dilemma that their marketing people and their creative people have because you can't, as you say, you can't just hold up a bundle of fibres and go, check this Buy shit this. out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, and I guess, you know, I guess that's the, 
that's a challenge we all have. You know, me and Ian from a journalistic point of view, yours from a professional point of view, Rich over there from a comms point of view. You mean you don't want to be shaved on the top of Mount Snowden like Kevin no. Bacon? Anyone comes near me with a robot arm with a razor on it, <laughs> there's going to be violence. Um, no, that's, that's your new book. Can't think. Of, I can't think of. Yes. <laughs> I know. Hopefully that will sell a bit better. Um, um, so yeah. So anyway, I'm going to I'm going to move it on because uh, we've done like nearly with one about an hour and 20 minutes um and also we've got a pub booked for us to go to after um so Thank we're done we're done we late for that keep nolan waiting and uh andrew, pouring. Pretty, pretty and it smells like a brewery up. in here doesn't it <laughs> probably does i mean i was i was waiting for the ac to kick in kicking when we started i was like god damn we're all gonna have a sweat on but i think the ac has kicked in a little bit hasn't it not much no <laughs> we might need to look at that have we got a little dial for the i'll open the door no well i'm all, I'm all right um, are you just am I not on camera anymore <laughs> are you just changing the battery yeah yeah oh well, anyway I'll, I'll start teeing it up in fact I'm going to hand it over to Ian anyway oh um, are you yeah because oh, okay. in terms of um, other news this week mm. we think that the predominant theme has been um, the an apparent inflection point in the sort of SVOD market or, mm. or the streaming market yeah 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 Oh, that is that bit of fresh air is nice. But there's going to be other people. We've just opened the the door to our studio, which is we don't normally have five people in here. We normally have like three, um, and um, all right, I can just picture this sort of cloud of sort of beery air <laughs> coming out of here into the rest of the office. Yeast. What are yes. those guys doing? <laughs> what the fuck is going on in there? This den of iniquity. A barley mist. Yeah. Um, but uh yes so so we're going to talk about that to round off and and you know neil as ever when we're talking about stuff that's sort of neutral you you pitch in as and when wh- sure. wherever suits sure. you um but i'm gonna hand it over to you first uh ian yeah. because you've been covering uh netflix numbers and, mm. and they, they, there's a bit of a fork in the road there isn't there yeah well i mean i predicted this actually a go few on, months go ago you. yeah look at me i, I should have shorted it well, I, I, don't th- I didn't predict it going... I think the stock went down this week on the day after they reported by something like 37%, okay, yeah. which is quite a, sh- a start for... No, 37%. Was it 37%? It was 37%. Yeah. Damn. So you're talking of something like 50 billion wiped off the market cap. Wiped is the uh, approved... Wiped is the word. The approved verb yeah. for stock um, price. And all because... And yet the figures are good, you know, the, the, in terms of what, you know, if you look at the, the, the revenues and the, 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 the profit they're still figures, doing they're right. still good. They it's technically all added half a million subscribers, but with Russia, they l- Oh, was that it? That no, lost made the net. There was a net loss of customers, 200,000. Yeah, but he's, but take, he's, he's extracting Russia. They lost 700,000 from Russia. They did, yeah. They had to take it's, Russian yeah. customers out. I think they did, they did really well in Asia. Where they picked up like more than a million right. new customers on the success of things like Squid, Squid Game, shit. Um, but they're losing customers in Europe and uh, America. I'm thinking of, and I think I've done it. And then they disconnected I think customers I've clocked, in. I've clocked Netflix. <laughs> they they disconnected in 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 Russia. I mean, and there, there's there's various problems. I think one is they they're raising prices like the other platforms are doing at a time when people are being squeezed on costs and inflation is going up and it all of a sudden people are thinking what 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 do we make yeah. cutbacks they've to? been rising and i feel like they've been like raising a, them fairly regularly as well like yeah about a quid a year or something like that yeah and no one really has done anything i don't think until now so I'm, I'm you know when, you, when your like, energy bill is consuming most of your salary then you, you're oh, thinking i don't want to start i just got my <laughs> update on that yeah Sick. Um, <laughs> and I, I think the other um, that's one issue. I think for me, the other issue, which is the thing I wrote about a few months ago, is it's just lots more competition coming into the market. And I th- I've always said there's a finite number of platforms that people are going to subscribe to. You know, yeah. how many? What's the average number of platforms that uh, an average household will take? Three. We we've, we've got three. And the conversation in our house at the moment is, do we drop one of them at the moment because? Yeah. Things are getting expensive. Well, you got, you got Amazon, and, you got Netflix, well, and, and you got and, and I have to say, the one that's at the top of the list is Netflix because right. Amazon comes with the benefit of free Deliveries groceries, yeah. which at a time like now is great, obviously. Yeah. Um, Disney, the kids love because it's got all the Marvel superhero stuff and the ne- Mandalorian and the Mandalorian and things like that. And, is that and good? whereas Netflix oh, is awesome. sort of right. Netflix is sort of the one that um, we don't really adults. look at that much, <laughs> to be no. honest with you. And um, once, once you've done a Dave Chappelle special, I, I think, think the other issue for them at the moment is that they're quite small compared with the, the, the really big guys. If you look at Apple getting into this, Apple TV and, and Amazon, we're doing a trial on in that. In terms right? of their resources that they have, I mean, he was asked on the, Reed Hastings was asked on the earnings call, 
are you going to start cutting content spend? I think they spend. They're planning on. They were planning on spending 18 billion this year. They've got revenues of 30 billion. So they've obviously tried to be very, very um, frugal elsewhere. You know, they're heavily reliant on Amazon, for instance. They're all in on Amazon with their cloud computing infrastructure. They've even yeah. drawn attention to that in SEC filings about the risks of being. You know, of having all in on everything. AWS. They don't have any other. Um, Really? You know, which, well, they're obviously going to better deal that way, but well, they don't they have They better not say anything of, too conservative, or um, AWS will just cut them off. But they're very concerned about keeping the margin where it is. So the so the forecast for the second quarter, I think, the operating margin is going up to, they want it to go up to 26% from 21%. Like they actually want to increase profitability, right. which implies they're going to have to make some cuts on content. Got now, as soon as you start spending on cutting on content spend, then you, you've got Amazon this year producing some Lord of the Rings prequel where they're spending God knows what on each episode. And it's all about a race to make more lavish and more, you know, expensive looking shows. Uh, you know, I don't, I mean, the most um, movie. Netflix isn't finished, is it? What was but that? it's. Uh, Red Notice? Not a good movie, but it was the most watched Red movie. Red Notice? Last year. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing with um, The Rock the in it. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Reynolds. The Rock. Ryan Reynolds. I can't and, yeah, Ryan Reynolds is all over Netflix. Every time I get served up, it's just his gurning face <laughs> staring they at me. They had the most watched movie with Red Notice and the most watched TV show with Squid Game. Right. But that's not enough, I guess. So, so, but so then the, the, oh, other, sorry, the, I was yeah. say the other problem they've got is um, they've got about 210, 220 million paying customers at the moment, I think. They've got 100 million households who use the service without paying anything because that was one of people have gone loans, to their parents. It? Why don't you just sure, get on your smart right. TV? Why don't you just use my password? And they've not really done anything about this. They've just sort of left it. <laughs> I, I once went to uh, uh, um, Airbnb and we turned the TV on. I had getting ready to put the someone, net, left net, their someone left their login we just left it and, and used it it was just easier to do that than I log think we out. should offer a cheaper version well, this is with what less uh, like simultaneous device this is what they're talking about doing they're talking about an ad funded model where they well that's a different cut, thing again. it's a different thing but it's a dangerous move to make because in saturated markets you can cannibalise your user base you get people going oh well I'll take mm. the ad funded model but well, I'm totally. going to cut my spend to three three pounds a month And so how they introduce that how they roll that out is going to have to be they have to be quite careful about how they do it. And there's various analyst views on whether that's a good thing or not. I think some of the guys in America who cover video really well are, are dubious. Other people think it's possibly a good move. But Disney and Hulu I, are doing it. Yeah, it works for them. Yeah, it does. But they've probably done it. Disney's a much younger service, isn't it? The Disney Plus service. So mm. um, I think, I mean, if you think about it from a, as a, as a fantastic TV watcher, you can tell by my frame um, <laughs> that, you know, when you're have, not you ever seen so, have, you, have you ever seen so much great content? No, no, it's I ridiculous. Mean, so as, you can't as, consume it. As a it buyer all. of content, it's, it's glorious. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I remember sort of years ago um, writing about like sort of these new sort of catch-up services that were coming on. Maybe maybe it's the terrestrial ones. And I was thinking that's all well and good, but when am I going to catch up on this shit? Because <laughs> there's so much of it about. It's not live. Um, also, if think, even if you had four of those subscriptions, it's still way cheaper than cable TV back in the day. But so I'll tell you another weird thing. Like, a little while back, I had some bug or other, and I was just feeling very floppy and just wanted to lie in bed and watch telly. And I'd be flicking through Netflix or, or Amazon Video. And I was such a sort of pampered little bitch about it. You're because just, I'd be like, nah, nah, bored, yeah. bored, bored. That's with you know, everyone. Tons of every, stuff tons that of I hadn't watched. Yeah, But... You get this very pampered, entitled sort it's of air much. about you, and that and that's where you end up watching the na- latest Marvel blockbuster because you're Which looking you've seen for. Already. It's a bit like you know. It's a bit like you know. I've always been really bad at picking up fiction books, where I'll I'll pick it up and I'll read like a couple of pages, and if it doesn't grab me, I'll just put it down, which is obviously bullshit you should just stick with it and read even if it's identity thing. crisis uh, except for my own book of course which i read on a <laughs> daily basis <laughs> because i'm an utter narcissist um <laughs> no i haven't read it for about a year actually my, my wife's a genius at finding great things on right. Netflix. so she she found this thing called the, the travelers where they're coming back in time and and i was like and she's watching i'm like what is that and i got into it because she was watching it but i, I i'm with you i find it hard to find something that i want to watch yeah. like, unless it's got some big campaign around it like the mandal as a star wars not the mandalorian i was like yeah i'm watching that there's almost um, too much choice on netflix yeah. so you, you find yourself sitting there scrolling through things and do i really yeah. want to watch this and you start and then you think oh well, i don't i'll change it's also to because the, it's also because the, i think it's also because the way that some of this content has gone whereas back in the day you'd, you'd watch something like i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna make you laugh starsky and hutch and there was a star a middle and an end yeah whereas content today there's a star a middle 
and then you have to tune into mm. the next episode, yeah. and then the next episode, and the you next get some episode. of those ones that turn into real sort of cliffhanger things. Me freaking nuts! Yeah, yeah. I've, I've gone off. I'm like, lost. Ah, lost. Yeah, lost, lost was, was lost the, was one of the first. That was yeah. the quintessential one, wasn't it? They kept dragging it out. Twenty four was the other one. They got it. Uh, They're still mm. lost. Drove Don't be fuckers. Mental. Well, Amazon's just released all the James Bond films uh, in one go for Is free. It? Yeah, they're awesome. all available, every single one. So we spent this week just watching a different one each night Shocking. instead of watching. Uh, which is like going from the start. This is going like back Do- to 60, Doctor 70. No. We've done Doctor you know, No from Russia with the Love. The best thing is James... Is and uh, Goldfinger. <laughs> Sean Connery throwing the, the light in the bath and the guy explodes yeah. and he stands up. Shocking. <laughs> yeah. I can watch that over and over and over again. I think he's still the best Bond. Original totally. best. Oh, yes. Yeah. I agree. He's got that... He's I, my I, grandmother's I, milkman. No way. True story. God wow. damn. I, knew, I did hear he was a milkman. So, he, he and, and actually, to, is that one of those little urban myths that Scottish people have? No, it's a true, that is 100% true. Right. And, and, and actually, he he came back to Edinburgh at the Usher Hall, which is where I, li- where I grew up, a place called Grinley Street. And he invited my grandmother to get his ceremony of when he was given the key of, of the city. True story. Cool. Well, that is very cool. Um, no, he's a legend. I love Sean Connery. I, lo- I love it when he, when he, when he's in things like Highlander or whatever, and they go, "You got to be well, a Spanish, Spanish guy." Go, yeah, I'll be Spanish. <laughs> or and, a Lithuanian you know, like, submarine captain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm Sean Connery. I don't do accents. I'll tell you I what accent him. I do. I do Sean Connery. That's the accent I do. Hunt for Red October is amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but he's just a great actor. He's just so much presence. Or uh, what's the the they, they bring a knife, you bring a gun. Yeah, you I'm send one of your men to the hospital, you send yeah. one of theirs to the morgue. Exactly. That was his Untouch- Irishman in, uh, yeah. in, uh, in The Untouchables. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Nat- Give me your For Irish. Sure, Sean Connery. <laughs> Make yeah. sure you come home alive. Wasn't there, wasn't there a spitting image puppet of him doing different accents <laughs> that all sounded the same? But there was a spitting image puppet of Roger Moore talking about um, Bond. With his eyebrows. With his eyebrows, yeah. yeah. They, were like, they, were like, they were like, Roger, give me anguish. And one eyebrow <laughs> would just sort of pivot up. Because uh, his, his range was limited. Um... But uh, yes, and then the other thing about this this streaming, um, I was just going to say on Netflix. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, on. The other the other nasty thing that they revealed was so it was two hundred thousand down net this quarter, but next this current sorry last quarter the, the yeah. one that's going check. at the moment quarter two is they expect to lose two million subscribers. Wow. Yeah, so it's not a blip. It's not a blip. No. Yeah. No, that's hardcore, and that, that's probably. I mean, as we know, and that's for, I think one of the reasons that because people are now thinking it's not really a growth stock. It's yeah, well, you well know. and we understand those of us who 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 talk about money. Well, they're being, shooting really low, so that they go, look, we actually bro- broke even. I hey. think I think there's rules about um, being too cheeky with your outlook yeah. when you're a public company. But mm. you know, we all know anyone who who sort of writes about well, they should know who writes about share prices and uses verbs like wiped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> has to know that erased that what a share price is is actually a bet on the future because some people go why is the share price going down they still made loads of money because of course the share price has gone down is because the people who are betting on them three six twelve months in the future are thinking oh, shit. They, did they expect but them to keep adding 10 million people well, that's every why quarter. that's why i treat it's, it like a ponzi scheme as long as it keeps going it, I mean, it's, it's not been it's a good a week for it's internet stocks bubble. generally actually it's not been a good week for internet stocks generally mm. it's not been no. a good year for internet stocks actually no well they were very inflated during the i mean lockdown. i mean a, a smaller one that, that reported last night that's gone down is snap you know snap yep, snapchat, snapchat. um they, they were down to the five five percent not anywhere right. near what netflix suffered but they're, they're, yeah they've got they've racked so they've ever since they went public they've um They've now lost seven point seven billion net losses total total over that period since twenty sixteen, and then, and they're they're making yeah. massive investments in R and D and trying to go into AR and do other things because obviously just this original service of sending photos around that lasts a few seconds and then disappears probably not something you can make a lot of money off in the long run. So Un- unsurprisingly, <laughs> <laughs> what well, do you know, I I don't know how they make the money. Presumably it's like sort of little ads that they it's love ads, at you. It's ads, yeah, um, yeah. but. Ads. But yes, it's all that attention economy, and you know that brings me on to the CNN Plus thing. So, you know, CNN in, in the states, you know, I'm, I know we have a few American listeners, which is always cool. When you do a podcast, you just get listeners lot. from all over the shop, don't you? Um, but my understanding, my Brit perspective of the American media landscape is, you know, we're polarised. We're like the Guardian's a bit lefty, and the Telegraph's a bit righty, and all that sort of thing. But they're fucking mental over there. <laughs> There's just no one in the middle. Mm. And it's mainly 
what they they don't call they don't see left and right they see liberal and conservative uh, or Democrat and Republican, I suppose. They seem to be interchangeable. And it's mainly liberal, like MSNBC, CNN, um, Washington Post, New York Times. They're all over on that side. And then you've got Fox News as the main TV one that's over on the conservative righty side. And then I suppose newspapers, I don't know, something, New York Post maybe. Something like that. Anyway, but it's all just polarised. There's no one in the middle just going, well, I'm a bit of this, I'm a bit of that. Uh, it just Opinions. seems to be. It just seems to be the nature of the, of the culture over there. Bless them. Um, That's why they all buy the Economist. Yeah, well, the, so to the get, Economist to get, to get this sort of more middly thing. Well, that is quite middly. I, it is. It, it does really well in America, apparently. It does. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. I, I would. I would actually say Economist lean slightly left, by my perspective. But yes. <coughs> on on social issues, economically, it's leans leans right. Obviously. Yeah. It's well. It's supposed to be quite sort of laissez faire. <laughs> all the things I'm into, Pierre. <coughs> anyway. um, uh, yes. TM. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so CNN is one of the biggest, um, obviously, as its name implies, cable news networks, and and with good reason. You know, back in the day, it, it sort of it sort of invented rolling twenty four hour news and and all that sort of thing. And cable, you know, we don't really talk about cable in the UK, but cable basically means sort of subscription, but not SVOD as we know it now, like Netflix and that sort of thing. I remember years ago, my dad um, lived in the States for years. We'd go over there when we still had like three channels or four channels, showing my age there. Um, and and then we'd go over there and there'd be a million channels on cable and we'd be like, what the fuck? Yeah. Although as we've just gone through, that's not necessarily a good thing, having that much choice. And and CNN was always the biggest one for news. But certainly since um, 2020, uh, without Trump to write about, um, their numbers seem to go down the toilet. And like I said in the intro, they came up with this bright idea of launching CNN Plus, uh, the, the nomenclature seems to be in, inspired by Disney because their SVOD thing's called Disney Plus, isn't it? Um, but they don't seem to have got any further than thinking, all right, we're a bit short of cash. Let's make people pay for what seems to be nominally the same as they would have got for free. It's now, dead in the water. Do you know what I mean? Well, and, it, and it's so dead in the water that less than a month after they launched it, amid much fanfare and hype, and expenditure they just pull the plug now there is there's there's one other factor that needs to be borne in mind which is another failed massive M&A which is AT&T's acquisition of Time Warner which went through various iterations it was always shit I don't know about you I was saying it was a shit idea from the start I just couldn't see it I might um, might put uh, Neil on the spot and ask him about uh, <laughs> ask him about telecoms companies getting into content in a sec um, but I just couldn't see it, and no one no. could see it. But for some reason, these 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 CEOs and these management consultants and these bankers and whoever it is that makes these decisions live in this weird echo chamber where where they can convince themselves it's a great idea. In the end, they've ended up divesting it into this company th that merged with Discovery, which does long tail like documentaries. Well, I just thought the premise like was flawed because it was sold by Randall Stevenson. He was the former CEO. As they said, it would to have a vertically integrated business like that would give us some kind of advantage over Netflix. And yet yeah. Netflix does well because it's not vertically integrated. Yeah. And, and the vertically integrated uh, bit just, being we own the really pipe and the all. content and that somehow Yeah, good. it didn't really square with me at all. But um, No, yeah, and, and, uh, and lo and behold, it, you know... I mean, the back of the fag packet calculation says that I think they lost... They basically wrote off about a third of the value of the acquisition when they um, divested it into this new um, Warner Media Discovery thing. And then one of the first things the Warner Media Discovery people did was like, well, then fuck CNN Plus, because that's obviously bullshit, they concluded. And, and But it's just... You know, and that by itself... So and you how long did it, it lost, CNN Plus? Less than a month. A month, well. Wow. Less that's, than a month. And how much did they spend on it? I don't know, but hundreds of they millions. They had 10,000 subscribers after two weeks. <laughs> 10,000. There was a, I, I put up, when I wrote it up today, That's I put in bad. a bunch of tweets. That's so 70 I kind grand of, a month. I did revenue. some sort of lazy journalism because I had to sort of get in for this, but which basically means <laughs> embedding loads of tweets. Um, <laughs> and what was one of the tweets? So some bloke, I don't know, Chris Backer, Backy, he goes, if you think you're having a bad week, just remember that the team at Warner Media who lost $5.9 million oh, a day this. at Quibi, yeah. and Quibi was the one we were talking about earlier with the mobile specific, were the same backers, and I think he's taking some liberties with the truth, because I, I don't think they're exactly the same, but for the sake of a, a tweet, um, were the same backers of CNN Plus, where they lost $9.4 million a day. It's I mean, that's a good, good going. Out of it anyway. I have some big days out, but I, I don't blow that much. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, 
and and the, the the story I wrote, I, j- I just sort of had a bit of fun with the fact it's called CNN Plus. So I said, uh, CNN Plus Musk equals changing of the guard. And one of the reasons I like to write that <coughs> is because I know it really winds up. There's certain people where you try and imply, where I have a go, I pop it like the establishment in inverted commas. And there are certain people that just really gets on their tits. And I like nothing more than having people cry on the comments when I write a story like that. And... Um, but I don't know. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Go for it. <laughs> bring it on. Um, but my point is, and the reason I bring on Musk, I'm not going to dwell on Musk because we spoke about him last week, but you know, he's, he's trying to buy Twitter and, and Twitter's done this, what I think very bad faith poison pill thing, which is basically trying to dilute everyone's shareholding just in order to prevent him buying it. Whereas I think if you're a public company, then shareholders, you know, you go, hello, shareholders, I'll give you 50% more than your shares are currently worth. Yes or no then shareholders say yes or no. And if 51% of them say yes, then it should be a done deal. I think it should be as simple as that, but obviously it isn't. And so they got this poison pill, and now he's um, going to do a tender offer where instead of making the offer to the board, who are, obviously, who are obviously opposed to it, a tender offer is going direct to shareholders, but this poison pill could still get in the way of that. So then you might get things like proxy fights, which are other arcane terms like that, where all gets very um, involved and Wall Streety and, and messy. Maybe they're hoping they can get more for it. Well, then they should say so because the share pr- because yeah, what well, he's offering is not very much compared with what it was worth last year, is it? Yeah, but I mean, then yeah, but then see, look here. If you want to buy us, it's this much. Yeah, exactly. a lot of Companies have done that. Yeah, it's not it's not rocket science, is it? No. To, as someone who who no, has an interest it's in definitely rocket science. not rocket science. But <laughs> <laughs> if anyone knows about rocket science, it's, it's Mr. Musk. Let's see. <laughs> well, that's true. That's probably why they're not doing it. Though. Jesus Christ, don't get into rocket science. The bloke will kill us. He just got a. I think that he just got a thirty billion dollar bonus from Tesla. I think Did twenty nine billion. No. He hit all the targets. Yeah, but yeah. He didn't get he didn't get a thirty billion dollar bonus. I think I think that's million it. maybe. No, he's no, not no. going to get a thirty billion dollar bonus. Jesus Christ, that's about how much Tesla's worth, isn't it? No. Tesla how much is Tesla worth? A hundred billion or something. Anyway, I don't. The, just to finish off that point, and then I'll, and then I'll do a, a quick. Elon chance. Musk in line for twenty three billion dollar bonus after Tesla's records results. Motherfucker. Sorry, 23 million. So maybe they're like, well, oh, you got 23 yeah. million in cash now. Like, what, what am I going to do with it? I'm why, do you think the, why do you think the board's against it, though? Well, I, so, th- so this, this comes back to my point, which is not really telecoms. This is a sort of Scott Pacino TM sort of rant. Um, I think, so my... Because um, if they can sell it to investors and investors are happy, then well, they've quite. done their job, haven't exactly. they? Um, so my... Uh, my strap line was the failure of CNN Plus and the establishment panic over Elon Musk's attempt to buy Twitter are related events. And the point I'm trying to make is CNN has failed because, um, partly because it's the plurality. Plurality. I shouldn't be using words like that at this stage of the pod. Plurality Evidently. of content. There's just so much out there. That's a better way of putting it, isn't it? Um, that I think new streaming services are kind of doomed. I can't imagine anyone. Yeah, too many platforms too many platforms and there's like just so peacock. much out there we were talking about the agony of choice and all that sort of thing when it's so, too niche when it's like you know like peacock we're like okay we got three shows we could put on yeah let's I know. start and then well, you just you just can't do it so so that was doing but i also they, think they that a, they need a couple of oj simpsons yeah. <laughs> in, in what sense in the sense that uh, so i had cnn back in the day i had cnn at home we on uh, the car oh, yeah. chase china, china oh, right. never went on all of a sudden, there's this crazy guy got driving, a helicopter driving and following yeah. him around. And everyone's like, oh, yeah. Johnny yeah. Depp now. And, and everyone was watching well, it, Well, uh, Trump was there, O.J. Simpson, for four years. Yeah, true. Um, true. But I, I, I genuinely think uh, my view, and this is this is where I get a little bit tinfoil hatty, um, I've got to apologise in advance, is I just think there's the, the establishment, which is hard to define, but it's the people who are currently in power, the people who have the most to defend in terms of the status quo. Um they're used to having there's something that a bloke called eric weinstein called a gated institutional narrative they're used to having a certain narrative that they can control through things like and i've told you it's been till for hat that they can control through through certain media that they don't necessarily directly control but they have a lot of inf- influence on let's say cnn or the bbc or or whatever or or, or newspapers and and I just think the genie's out of the bottle on that. People are getting their information from Joe Rogan, you know, even in a minor yeah. way from podcasts like this. Mm. But you know, the, the the barrier to entry for us doing this is is almost zero, isn't it? Yeah. And then we can stick it out there, and a few people will listen to it, and it might influence a few people. But the point is, the people who want to control the flow of information have no control over what we say in this room, and also our channels for broadcasting it. What were you going to say, Nick? Yeah, I mean, so look, 
as a telecom operator, I see my job as getting a packet from here and delivering it to there. What's in the packet is not a problem, right? Yeah. As as kind of Neil McRae kind of make the world a better place. What over the last few years, what I've been kind of um, disappointed about to use to try and find a word is the internet has done and I've worked on on building the internet since 1989 um, the internet has done so many great things but you can't ignore the fact that it, that it comes with some negatives as well yeah totally and, I can see that entirely you know and the, and the one I point out to is was you know 5G causes COVID <laughs> yes and we had all these crazy set well, fire to I'm going to stop you there because we had some great reads of yeah. uh, <laughs> it, it, that was like our Donald Trump to be honest that was I mean that was in you know that that how do you how do you to your point, how do we ensure the 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 weak or the or those that aren't able to to weak's the wrong word the, unreasonable the, the the people who who the naive are, maybe yeah naive who are who are trying to find a, a reason yeah or a purpose to find and truth. they get followed yeah. they, they follow this how do we ensure that they no, are you take right and there's so many and predators it's, it's and very, chances it, and it's very takers. difficult and and for me some of the things during the pandemic around you know that was one key aspect you know i i kind of thought in my in my mind of of building the internet i never thought that stuff like that would happen mm. and it was a, for me it was a bit of a wake-up call actually and yet and yet in hindsight when you think about unfettered lines of communication of course they're going to be abused of course they're going to be bad actors and you know that comes to, and I'm not going to get into this now, for no. God's sake. But you know that's where you get into the subject of censorship, which is a core interest of mine, and freedom of speech, which is who decides. Exactly. And yep. and I don't think any of us got the answer, but I, the thing that a lot of people are freaking out about Musk and Twitter is they don't want Musk to decide, but they seem to think it's all right for Jeff Bezos or some other oligarch to decide. I I I I, I mean I like I like his. A stance on free speech as, as, as a, my instincts are to like it you know the fact that yeah. he wants this as a platform that has done some you know I didn't like Facebook for instance doing things I think it was I don't know if Twitter even did it but when they were taking down stories where someone had suggested that Covid might have leaked from a Wuhan laboratory and then they only stopped check taking those stories down when Joe Biden launched an investigation. Now everybody right. everybody takes yeah, so that seat seriously as a possible, you know. And it was just a weird thing for them to be doing. I think Twitter might have done something like that. So I like him suggesting that things like that aren't going to happen under him, and that he's going to be much more anything goes. But I also don't like the idea of one guy totally like him being in charge of that because we don't really know, do we? I mean, if someone he's quite. I mean, he's quite touchy, isn't he? You know, he got yeah, he gets very worked about up about things. Off the, that Look at the whole pedo guy. guy yeah, yeah. Him, you know, so <laughs> yeah. no, I agree. With you. I actually it needs read. To be I read your really. I read your editorial on that, and I thought it was excellent. And I linked to it at the end of my piece today, um, and I thought it was point well made. You know, let's not overinvest in Musk. Oh, he seems all right. I quite like him. He's a bit yeah. spectrumy. Yeah. Um, what if and, he and I got, he's, I got he's a, a lot of respect for him, and he's, he's just a bit different. But that's n once he's got the power, he could go Bond villain on us. No worries. Oh yeah. Start wearing black polar necks and shit. One yeah. million dollars. Exactly. One billion dollars. <laughs> right. I think we've I think we've done another long one, haven't we? We've done nearly two hours. Maybe a long so, one. Wow. Well. Yeah. So Sorry. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've only drank two beers as well. That's, really that's a tragedy of it. Oh, um, that's that's oh. quite all right. Um, although the amount of beers I've drunk is also hastening the end <laughs> of this podcast. So I'm going to wrap it. I'm going to thank you again, Neil. It was great to have you here. Thanks for inviting uh, me. As our most was, grown up. It was, it was great. Thank you. Cool. I'm pleased you enjoyed it. Uh, let's see if you still think that when your team look at it when it's published. <laughs> but I don't think you said anything too crazy. And Rich is there. I haven't seen Rich sort of panic so far, but he's got quite a good poker face. <laughs> well that's it that's a good point but yeah thank you very much and I really enjoyed that and uh, thank you very much for listening and make sure you join us for the next one All right, toilet